Good morning to all the participants joining today. As we know, this is the last day of our Gyan course. And uh, today I am going to start with the parts which are remaining as well as some parts which were not shown or either they were not working, all that stuff. So as we recall, uh, Professor Bernie has yesterday done the defenses, few parts. Today he is going to do the backdoor defense. And uh, that backdoor defense slides I have sent you in the morning. So the participants would have received all the slides uh, of the, all the five days. And uh, along with that, uh, uh, like we also, he has also told that he will be telling about the backdoor attacks in detail today. So today's session of Professor Bernie is at around 5.30 India time. So let us start for our part. So whatever is, and today's my session would be from 9.30 to 11.30. So coming, let's, I am sharing my screen. Quickly, we'll go through the parts which were remaining as well as which were not shown. So before I could start anything, we are just going into the part uh, where uh, before, uh, which couldn't work. So I have uh, trained it again on my notebook, on my machine. And here that uh, uh, earlier MNST notebook was not working. It gave us around accuracy, all four, four it was showing. And uh, that we are, I have trained it again. So the training has occurred again. It had not trained. After some less number of epochs, it had come out. So here, as you could see, uh, the loss is very less. The loss, uh, once we go on uh, iterating, back propagating, uh, training the network, your loss goes on continuously going down. So I am loading the model, whatever is trained. So we are going for the, uh, uh, the ahead step. So here it was throwing an error, stack overflow, because it was not able to, we, are, we were not able to train it properly. So here let us uh, go down. So here I am uh, visualizing uh, the data set. I'll show the images which we are going to use 7, 2, et cetera, the ground truth images, which we call, right? And uh, once let us, these are 7, et cetera, these are the ground truth which are used. Now let us see what are the classification labels predicted by the class. So the prediction is the first number is 7, then it is 2, then it is 1. So you could just verify that here with whether it is correct. So I try to put it on one screen, 7, 2, 1. So I think I can see it here also. Uh, yeah, it is visible. So it is coming on one screen, 7, 2, 1, 0, 4, right, 1, 4, 9. So this stuff is coming here. So this is our prediction for the test set which were used. So let us calculate the accuracy. So after uh, doing on a small set, let's do it for the entire, uh, uh, use this 3776 images. And let us see how much percent accuracy we get for this small network. We get 98%, though it takes 10, 12 minutes of training time. Then we see on individual classes, we know that we are working on MNST data set. So you have 10 classes here. So let's see on individual zero recognized as zero. I have showed this on my slides on the GitHub as well as on my slides. So here I am showing it on the Colab notebook. So zero is zero, one is 99. 
so here you could draw an analogy that amongst all this eight is little bit difficult for this classifier huh? whatever we have used for this model what we have built so it is not necessary that it should be you can build a better model based on change of many things so this let's test on a random image so let's take a random image here we are uploading the image hand written this is hand written i had told that uh, not only from mnist it should also work on if you take your own images it should be able to work on that so let us see whether that works or not so i am uploading the image i'll show the plot im show plot im show so i am doing the so this is number 5 which we have used and now we want to see whether 5 will be predicted or not so this this is the scanned image here i am defining the transformation i am resizing it to my original size 32 32 so that it comes into 28 28 then i am giving it as an png image so you could see img 2.png so this is a random input given hand written input given this is not taken from the test set let us test this so here i have run this so it is going to give me the answer 5 okay so this is how our this particular notebook had not worked on the day which we had done because it came out while i was explaining it came out of the training and it was ill trained and you could have seen the loss was not large so it was giving you a uh, wrong answers everything was predicted as 4 although there were other numbers okay so that we have retrained now so it takes around 10 12 minutes so you can change your runtime you have a gpu on your here so you can change runtime type so you could make a gpu here you can say no means it will use your tp uh, your uh, cpu your machine whatever you are on uh, so here tpu means it is tensor processing unit it is faster than the gpu so you could do this and you could always uh, reduce your training time so i am just cancelling this part so this is shown the demo which was now incomplete earlier the uh, mnis demo is uh, now complete so we have done that part so let us quickly go to the outline part here whatever is remaining so i am coming back to my outline presentation quickly to tell you exactly what are the parts which are remaining here so uh, as we know we have done majorly professor burney has done till here yesterday he was talking about obscurity and all these attacks and also the transferability how easily it is transferable or not so in that i think he concluded with showing you a, a steg analysis uh, point of view how it is Uh, and also how the game theory comes into picture and also he showed you one one and a half year classifiers so that what he has finished till today as our uh, we know our threat is this uh, backdoor attacks that which he will be covering today coming to my parts we have started from this part we have come across this full box software we have seen right and we have seen cats and dogs problems and uh, we have also seen how it gets affected so that i have shown you in addition to that we are trying to do today we are in the few more uh, remarks we'll tell you about adversarial machine learning gan we are going to cover today along with showing you yesterday auto encoders output so as we know this was the topic which was planned and coming to this these are the students who have helped me here across all my days and all these uh, these notebooks are created by them right so this is across various discussions that we have across online meetings that i told them that you should do it in this fashion this fashion so they tried to do that so that they link it up with a single problem so those guidance we had given and they have done exactly as per that okay so here let us go back to our uh, notebook again so here i am going back to my notebook so yesterday the <clears throat> uh, auto encoder was taught in the slide format but i haven't told you in the notebook format we have also written <clears throat> sorry we have also written the auto encoder notebook and also this is again available for you for use so what is an auto encoder everything is written but yesterday i have told you from my slides i had put so this is how it looks on the notebook so i am not running this as you know it takes time so you can run this uh, python notebook on your colab also and you can see whether it works or not so here as we know auto encoder i have told you that they don't have the output they don't have the output layers fully connected layers softmax layer they don't have the output layers they have only the input cnn layers so basically they are working on the feature domain so as you look these are my input neurons here then you have the encoder so encoder starts from here set of cnn so many neurons it goes on reducing so you can have many here what how many again it depends on what problem you are trying to do 
you are going to come here then you are going to have this is the encode code what i told yesterday in my slide so if i could uh, put that quickly here so here we'll try to uh, see that slide and compare with what i have done yesterday so we have shown you this so this is the code what i was telling you and on my collab i have it here it is also called code <clears throat> or also it is called latent representation right so it is latent uh, representation then opposite to this you will have decoder is opposite of encoder you will go and you will going to get the you are going to get the output so output here will be the reconstructed image here so here if you use mnist data set you give some number like 1 or i so you will get this but you are going to definitely have neuron uh, this log going to not reconstruct fully so reconstruction error is going to be present in uh, the reconstructed output by the decoder or we don't call it uh, like this we call it an encoder only encoder is in the means auto encoder is made up of encoders and decoders but we call it as auto encoder so this is uh, what we show so we show it on demonstrate how we do it on mnist data set right so i'll show you this what are auto encoders and all i have told you so it will closely mimic the input and the output and that is what it will get a latent representation that's what i told you so let's go into architecture i think i have we know the architecture encoder and decoder so this is how it is so original one of the examples he has taken is a original image and your learned representation is again same so both are same and this is code or compressed data or called latent so uh, types of encoders as we know i will not discuss all this i have given in this notebook so that when you have your free time when you will share this with you people you can go through all this uh, different types of encoders and see how it helps you so this is vanilla encoder means simple encoder then then you have different types of encoder variational auto encoder i was telling you yesterday when we were closing the session where it's a generative model as what i told so the structure for each of this encoder is different for uh, for the auto encoder it is different variational auto encoder different all the structures are different and uh, how do we do it so we do it in this collab by importing tensorflow this is written in tensorflow you can also write it in pytorch we have intentionally taken mnist earlier in uh, pytorch and here we have used auto encoder in tensorflow so that you know both the packages so here we have shown you how to import the libraries how to take the data sets so this is the import code you can run this in colab here so when i click here in colab it this gets then matplotlib some things are common you can always take those sk learn library we have known earlier so that we train test and split all of this accuracy precision recall are there in that sk learn matrix library so uh, you have to call this the first one is to train on the mnist data set so he is calling a fashion mnist let's let's go a little bit later so let's see the data set what exactly it is so fashion mnist is something like this you have uh, this is again a data set but it is composing of composing of dresses so here you have dresses here some sandals you have bags uh, and all these coats and all this so how do you build this auto encoder so you write a class file to do that build an auto encoder from kiras go on putting input layers right so you go on putting input layers put the activation function just like you do for your earlier part where you did but only here you do not call put the uh, classification part so you are not going to put your uh, uh, classification part other things you are going to put all the other things you are going to do so here this is our representation and we are starting training so i am doing training here so as we train so here epochs the same thing we have captured it 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 takes lot of time to run this see when it goes through epoch 1 it goes through all this batch of images it takes this much steps your loss goes on should goes on decreasing as you go on in more epochs your loss should go on at one point where it is tolerable loss there you have to stop so let's see the results for the loss accuracy and loss so loss should come down as we train so this is training loss should always come down so i you see here the training loss is always is coming down as you go on training then let us test it after training you have to go to test 
so here you are giving on top so this is the test code for doing this so here taking this and plotting this this is your test code which we write and we show this which are the images which were tested so here these were the original images and as required as required as or expected we are going to get same thing output same output so this is what is the a uh, thing for shown for fashion mnist so is one more data set similarly you can do for face for face reconstruction i was telling yesterday that auto encoders are also used for face reconstruction okay this is data set is not uh, available easily this data set is made by our own uh, group people so our machine learning for everyone students have made made this data set by their own so you have 2000 images for training and 1000 for validation or testing all images are rgb format six people six classes are there okay and we have tested it across different variations we have tested facial we have tested the lighting and we have changed the alignments of people taken from different like this this way this way and still tested so it runs fine so this is one of our works which has been done at our laboratory here by my students so here we load the drive right so the uh, from here we drive it we zip this we take it we train this is the validation set and this is the training set so we take training i just increase the font if you are unable to see so this is training i take the training and this is the this so this is how we start uh, showing an auto encoder on our data set so training and testing how we do so this is the function for loading train and validation data so here we take our own data so we have put it in our folder and we build the data and we can i'll show you few of the examples here okay so here sample images i'm showing you so these are my students so here uh, we have named them as subjects but they all have names okay so here this is these are the different subjects which we have from different pose so uh, different angle but still if you even if it is taken from different angles auto encoder still recognizes that person correctly so we build our encoder so this uh, encoder we build here so this is how we build our encoder face encoder we have used auto encoder we use for faces we use convolution layers all these layers as we you uh, as like as told stride kernel size all that will be there then you are going to come down so we define this class and uh, this is how we write our code convolution 2d convolution 2d because i have told you auto encoder means encoders then you have latent representation then you have decoders so that is how it is built using convolution so this is relu is used as activation again you can use tanh also we take a drop out then we flatten then so we then we decode opposite of what should we encode so we go and decode here right so this is our again we use drop out this activation relu and here activation sigmoid this is the decoder output then this is finishing our face encoder so this is the face encoder that we have developed at our lab and here we uh, we we give that face to this particular and this is the model which we are echoing but instead of going through all this code if somebody wants to only understand only in terms of uh, parameters how much parameters so we have written a model uh, like this in a table format so that it is easy to understand how much parameters at each stage okay so what kind of model it is Uh, so here decoder decoder activation so total parameters are one lakh this unit stands hundred thousand is one lakh ten lakh so around ten lakh so it is twelve lakh so thirty nine thousand two thirty five parameters across this so we want to see this model how it looks this auto encoder this is how it looks we, uh, there it was put in this fashion here we have put it top to bottom so encoder encoder activation so this is how we do all these parts. so here we reshape we decode 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 should be there opposite and then finally your output class is should be there here how we train an encoder so this should be trained because no neural network or no dnn will work without training so we use this uh, we have to train this using callbacks so we'll use this uh, this tensor flow has all this uh, this particular um, uh, this uh, where you can call back and train it easily so many examples are there we have used one among them so we can do this so training the hyperparameters 
by defining callbacks is what our students have done so here we go, will not go through this detail because we want to show you the training cycle so here you know that training cycle is like this goes through across all the images so many loss it goes through this once the loss is optimized it comes out and as you see original is here reconstructed here is original is reconstructed here original reconstructed here all this so here you could see the uh, as you go ahead here it is bad so we have shown at every stage that's what i was telling you should have many layers initial layer it is something like this when it goes through epoch 2 your back propagation learns better so you see it is little bit more clearer reconstructions are more clearer goes through epoch 3 original is this you get back here more you train better it is so here your loss is coming down so here when we go through all these cycles i think they have gone through roughly around 10 i guess 7th 8 9 and here 10 so they have gone ahead than that they have shown i think let us go through how many they have shown in the cycles they have shown around yeah so they have shown 20 so they have shown 20 here the 20th if you see you are having a better representation for the image then once the loss becomes very less see here the loss has become very small e raised to minus 4 so many zeros we stop so this is our results then we go we go, we plot our loss curve this you always have to do in machine learning you have to plot for plot your loss curve always so it comes down and then we have to predict so this is kind of testing validation images we have to give we have to see whether whatever we gave is correct or not right so we test it across changing all the poses for different stuff here so here if you could see here you could see the person is saying sit down but still it is reconstructed properly and echoed with the name so this kind of thing it is it is using for this so obviously as you know you can i have told you yesterday we can use this for you can use for denoising i think i, I think professor bernie was also telling you people about denoising example where he was telling you how even if you denoise it will be a defense so yesterday please recall he was telling you denoising as a defense strategy so you can use an auto encoder to do that so here we give our input we don't show our original input to the uh, to the auto encoder we give this entire auto this is entire auto encoder but we have shown it as encoder compressed and then decoder this entire auto encoder we give this uh, noisy images as as the input to the auto encoder reconstruction is all good images come out because it ignores the perturbations it ignores the perturbations so as you see here it has ignored and you can take out you can see easily on the right hand side these are the digits which are used you can do this we have done this and shown so that mnist denoising you can do similarly we have denoised our faces so here we have denoised our faces so oh, these were the original images we added noise we did not give the original images we gave the noise images to the auto encoder and when we gave the noise images this is the face auto encoder that just now what we built was tested for this we gave this right and we trained it again this is the training part which is shown here and when it came out this is the loss accuracy for those uh, what you call these noisy images so when it comes loss accuracy comes down we uh, we will try to test our model so decoded images denoise let us see whether we will denoise properly or not this was original right these are all original images and here you can see they are denoised of course we have not shown we have not shown the we have not shown how much psnr how much ssim all these things we have that's in whatever reports we have written as a scientific article there we have put here we want to show you a notebook to tell you to get started with or get accustomed to machine learning and deep learning using colab notebooks so that's why we have shown you this is not if you want too much details then we'll have to go through our papers whatever we have published okay then going to face auto this you can also use face identification because auto encoder is difficult to attack right uh, though it is easy the people have attacked and left that's a different but for beginners like us we can think that auto encoders are relatively easy, uh, difficult to attack as compared to as compared to your 
uh, your classifiers, CNN classifiers. Because in CNN classifier, what happens? Output layer you can target and change, right? So that is what you can do. But so that combination, I've switched to auto encoders and Siamese networks, and they are trying to use those as your networks for training testing, right? So one of the examples I'm showing you, same auto encoder, objective four, face identification. So face identification recognition is little bit different problem. So this is the problem which is here. See, this is a verification system and this is a recognition system. Both are different. Both are different and both objective measures in both are different. So if you give two images and if it is verification system, it will tell that person yes or no. So it is like what Professor Bernie was telling you yesterday, one class problem. It will tell either it is a toaster or not a toaster or whether it is a bird or not a bird. It will not tell to the other one what it is. So if it is bird versus aeroplane, it will not tell it is aeroplane. It will tell not a bird. Like this, suppose we build a face verification system. Here it will, there are two people who are verifying. It will tell you this name. So this is Satya and the below one is not Satya. This is what is the job of face verification system. Okay. So face verification system generally is used to give entries in known settings. Suppose this is my room and on my door, I have kept a face recognition system, face verification system. Then if I want to enter, it will tell me whether this person I should enter or not. Right. So if I am the correct person, then it will say yes, enter or it will say you are not. Don't uh, uh, yeah, it will say uh, authentication failed. So verification system is like this. OK, next one is your recognition system. Here you are going to give different parts. And here you are going to say you are going to output the labels belonging to these people. So here you are going to say this is Satya, this is Mark. Okay, so this is obviously Elon Musk. So here you have not given this one training, so it doesn't know. So recognition always outputs correct labels. It should output the correct labels, right? Like it may be 1000 labels, it may be 20,000 labels, whatever labels, classes. But a verification system, it's not like that. Verification should only give access to people who are who should go in okay and various places use different so this is in a closed environment some factories or some organizations we use verification system because here these people won't be coming inside but at uh, general uh, like uh, traffic surveillance airport etc okay there we are going to use recognition so here we want to recognize recognize the people who are who break law Right. So I think I have a chat message here. OK, yeah, I'll just uh, tell about this. We'll go to that. Uh, so here what I'm trying to say is application is different. This will be in closed indoor settings, known settings. Here it may be outside anyway at public places. Here we want the labels. So here it will be recognizing people who are lawbreakers, thieves, all these people we want to find out that we want to label. So recognition systems application is somewhere different. Verification system somewhere different. So verification system, you can also use thumb. So whatever earlier thumb thumbs were used, it's a verification system. It will give attendance. So you can use thumb for attendance, thumb to come in, thumb to go out, all these things. And you can attack those also. So these are the things here. So for this verification uses this one is to one matching. So it will match whether it is Satya or not. Face identification or recognition is one is to n, right? So it will go on outputting. It should tell me what exactly. So building our encoder, we have encoded this. So we uh, let's see this encoder part. Okay. So this is how we have encoded, and these are our parameters. I, we have just uh, you can also put this in a uh, model part like this and come down. So we have done this. So here we have put this is. 6 lakh 17 parameters for this then we are all our trainable parameters so then there are three classes for my train set so let's do it for a simple so only tra training we do for three so we train this part so i go through this quickly this is how we train right using some distance measure and this is how we come out this is the distance so he identified as subject one so this was the person Subject one, subject one. This was the correct where it is a verification problem. But if you see, it will tell the distance measure here because this is not a this is not a classifier. It is not a classifier in the classifier sense. 
here it is going to measure distance so here whichever is the minimum whichever is the minimum here it will tell so obviously the distance is 12 here so this subject one is the unknown person unknown person it is definitely not subject to because the distance is large here the distance is large so it compares this distance and gives so here if you see arg min distance with subject one and whichever is the minimum that is the exact subject which is the unknown subject okay so this is how you build and we don't go much subject two we give right so subject two we see with subject one it is 13 with subject uh, two it is 10 and with subject three it is 16 so obviously subject two is distance 10 so that will be returned so we come out of this so here uh, we show this okay so any random image we can remember so here if i want to summarize how do we what are the points to remember it is data specific it is unsupervised it is lossy so you can use it for different simple encoder we have given but nowadays this is not by knowing one auto encoder you cannot publish a paper obviously so here this is just a starters notebook when when we write notebooks we write very large notebooks we la do large amount of training testing i am not showing it here because it becomes unnecessarily complex it doesn't fit my time schedule here but what we want to try to tell you how a auto encoder is so we have done this experiment we have shown you the denoising so if i see go back to our whatever we have shown you yesterday these parts i have shown you today in the collab so you can run this and you can train this i am not doing it uh, because it takes time but we will give you all the notebooks you can at your time or you can ask your students if your faculty somewhere you can ask your students to go through this maybe it will be helpful for them and some people will become will become interested in this area so you go through this for denoising application i have shown accuracy and all you can calculate okay so this is what was the idea for this part so i think there were some questions i'll come back to uh, the questions and here let us look back here so here let us come back so i will just stop share and let us come back to the questions i think we had some parts in the chat uh, is it possible to reconstruct the image without loss or having higher psnr through auto can auto -can? no it is not possible you are going to have uh, you are going to have a loss because uh, that is what is the because see it is kind of subsampling you are taking an input image right so i'll just minimize this Okay, you are taking an input image. You are trying to do what? You are trying to subsample. Your CNN represent features you are going to learn. So if you are having six simple, go to our simple example, six by six. So if you have a specific six by six, you are coming with four by four. If you do not pad, then you are coming with three by three. Then you are going down. Max pool you are doing. So you are going down. So obviously when you are going down, you are subsampling. You are going to lose information. But yes, PSNR you are going to lose. But in general applications, which are not very, uh, I mean, loss sensitive, it is still acceptable. Because our recognition, see, if you take an image of a cat or a dog, it will still be a cat if you uh, subsample. That's the idea. I think that also was being told by Professor Bernie, why, why exactly by subsampling? I think he has covered some part and there were overlap in what we said also. Okay, I hope the answer to this question is no. It will be difficult for us to reconstruct the image without loss. Uh, so PSNR is going to come down. Uh, our aim would be to keep PSNR high so that they don't understand. If because if PSNR becomes deteriorating, people will understand system is under attack. So that I think yesterday also he has told in detail. So uh, that is what is the answer for this question. So like this, I want to uh, hear more questions from all of you. Any questions with the auto encoder part and yesterday what we day before yesterday our network did not work we made it work today and I showed you any questions on that and we have intentionally kept things simple by taking simple data sets that intentionally we have kept. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. So is the uh, is at least fifty PSNR fifty DB? I think you are asking. So I think the participant is meaning fifty PSNR. Yesterday you have seen. I think sixty was also possible. Right, 50, 60, yeah, 50, 60 is also possible with what experiments he carried out in his lab. He has shown and uh, all of that is reproducible. You can take those from his lab. Uh, this also you can see that 50, 60 is very high. So for people who have done image processing, we know that 35, 40 is itself high. 
okay because any enhancement algorithm you run you run it on uh, what you call this uh, suppose you do restoration or you do enhancement you run this and you compare psnrs so generally psnrs are around 25 30 like that but we have seen 40s and all 50s easily we have seen so uh, so that we have seen so yes it is possible yes any questions Ah, sir. Yeah, 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 please. Regarding the PSNR, yeah. Actually, PSNR, uh, we will not be able to distinguish if it was uh, above 40. Mm -hmm. Hello. I think there is some disturbance. Yeah, yeah, one second. I'll... Yeah. I think now it's okay. Yeah, now it's now it's tell me. Uh, actually, the about 40. Our human eye will not be able to visualize yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As he rightly says, HVS, uh, I think uh, he's telling about human visual systems. This is what is called, I think those who have done the course on multimedia would know that it is called psychovisual redundancy. I think it was Professor Sen Gupta at IIT Kharagpur who taught us all this. Okay, so it is uh, one is your uh, one is your spatial redundancy, which image is exploited. It's pixel. Pixel yeah. redundancy, yeah, pixel redundancy, redundancy is, psycho visual redundancy. Psycho, yeah. So I think I'll just tell because he asked this question. So let me give give me two minutes. I'll answer this. So whenever you have uh, these images, na, your images are more similar to your neighbors. See, it is practical example. Whenever you are sitting in one class, so you are doing suppose you are doing a class of class eight, class nine. You are doing. You have a majority, almost ninety percent of your friends who belong to the same age group and who belong to the same class. So you won't, unless if somebody has not passed, the exam would have failed and remained there, one or two people like that. But apart from that, you will have, suppose a class of 50, then you will have at least 45 people of your almost same age group, six months, one year, here and there, because of school admission system not being uniform, right? And uh, you won't have somebody in class nine who is in uh, say class 12, right? So unless that person of that age, so your neighbors are going to be similar as you. So in images also, it's like that. So if you click an image from here, okay, from suppose this camera clicks my image here. So what is going to change? Maximum what is going to change is if I largely disturb these room settings, then it is going to change. Else what is going to change is what I have worn today. Yesterday what I have worn would be different from today. That itself is going to change, but other things are going to remain. So this your neighbors are going, if you click some photo, you will see that many times major areas are uniform, means it is similar. That is why images are compressible. So instead of uh, writing, so if you go behind my screen, you have a white wall, you have a clock. So that if you see the pixels on the white wall, all are similar. So if you know one, you know everybody because it is similar. And wherever there is change, there you can detect an edge. And from there onwards, again, that other thing will repeat. So this is called spatial, as he said, pixel redundancy or spatial redundancy. One more thing is your psychovisual redundancy is what we can see, right? Suppose see these are the tube lights which are there on my room here like this. So here, whatever you can see on top, they are actually switching off and switching on, switching on and switching off. Or if I on this fan, which is here, it will, if I start rotating this, human eye can't see how many blades are there on this. But if you ask, if you ask how many blades are there, you can see this and you can see three. But if you just apply some intelligence, you say that in India, there are three blades. But if it is not in India, there is possibility of four blades, right? So that you can see. So what I'm trying to say is human eye cannot see the switch off, switch on cycles if it is very large. It's very similarly, human eye cannot make out the blur. What he is trying to say is that human above 40 dB, Human eye cannot make out certain things, color. If you give intense colors, it will tell that this is pink. Human eye cannot. This is called uh, psychovisual because it is related to our visual system and psychology. Psychovisual system, but machines can find out. So machines can say that, okay, this is 50 dB, this is 40, but for human eye, 40 dB, 50 dB looks very good. 
human eye only will be understand only if you bring your images in 18 db 19 db blurs will start coming there you will say it is degraded human eye can note that right so this is special one is uh, the psycho visual and one more will be temporal redundancy temporal means in videos suppose you are taking this video this video is getting live streamed so if you take this video what will change in this video if i do not use slide i am telling what will change in this video nothing all the background will remain same so only whatever i do like this or i use my hand or why i put my hand on my hair only my movements here will change but the background will remain same so what is the idea is you do it across the time you don't need to code all these images so video processing is not done image by image though videos are in set of images they are not done they are done they are not done uh, image by image no your computing power will be over they how they are done is they are do, done using motion estimation means we'll take a photograph of this this is this uh, from this camera and all the maximum background will remain same only my hands move so whenever my hands move or my, i do some action only those areas we are encoding and we are adding it to the original so it is similar to whatever we see in our uh, we used to see our these uh, olden days if you somebody is very uh, know, knows all this uh, we go to these uh, movies where they are moving this film like this at a certain rate or you would have seen some children putting their eye over some uh, this uh, uh, the, like a pinhole camera is there and inside they see it's like moving because somebody is rotating behind are we getting this that is called that is called temporal redundancy so it is you have three types of redundancy spatial pixel neighbors are always similar right next is your spatial this is your psycho visual where you cannot human eye cannot find out hvs human visual system third is temporal right so all these redundancies is the uh, the thing which helps us in doing the compression so the distortion as he said as rightly said i agree with that distortion beyond certain point cannot be seen by the human eye yeah so any other questions yeah so i think if there is no questions so let's go ahead i'll again share my screen today's part we are going into today's part an important part i think from i think i have an hour and uh, 15 minutes to tell you this a very important uh, it is called generative adversarial networks so if you see this particular part just see what refer to our course of adversarial signal processing so this word is same this word is same networks you know what exactly it is you should know that networks means you are going to have cnn networks so you have some network with convolution layers fully connected layer softmax layer all these layers right so only thing we have to understand what is a generator adversarial we know there is adversary present right so if there is an adversary present then you have to go into the cycle of uh, your defense and your attack you have to go into this cycle networks we know this is not computer networks or your uh, networks from networking point this is our cnn architectures now only we have to understand what is the word generate and this gans what is this gans so before we go to what is this gans so i'll just tell you this if you can uh, go here so i'll try to put this uh, here so gan so you just write gan uh, generative adversarial networks do this so you say author so you come across a person here okay general this generative adversarial network by good fellow ian good fellow okay and you can refer his paper here you can refer his paper here what this it is 2014 so 2014 uh, paper here uh, this good fellows paper so you could just put his name right so here uh, this if you see this particular researcher who is a person considered to be uh, now uh, if you go through so you won't believe this these particular uh, citations citations is 1 lakh 85843 are we getting this 
this kind of citations only for these gans generative adverse real networks where you, you easily get around 40 plus 40000 plus citation for one gan right so what i am trying to say if you go through his all these things he is now leading the apple research group at uh, cupertino so he is that is where he is now currently at uh, employed at apple incorporated as a director of machine learning right and if you see his age he is 85 so he is very young younger than most of us are we getting this so here we are going into this the network which he proposed is called generative adversarial networks so this is taken from please uh, see this is again taken from uh, the gans is taken from from this good fellows paper so i am going into the gans so here gen what is this generative adversarial network and why we should know it so it is very interesting though it may be little bit difficult initially to understand but we'll try to make it as simple as possible so here uh, generative adversarial networks if you want to understand we already have understood about supervised classification we have already understood about supervised so what is supervised we build some model we build some model what are all models we have built right forget the deep networks go to our traditional networks which we have done in our earlier classes that uh, the flow the uh, uh, whatever uh, we started from beginning with iris data set you see what what are the things which we built we built svms we built logic regression all this input data it takes suppose it is this is iris so we have taken some examples iris so we have taken some example mnist while doing our uh, collab sessions okay so mnist data set whatever data set you take or f mnist fashion mnist we took right so these are the data sets we took obviously we know how to train and test thumb rules we have understood we built a model we built a model that you can use any model right ml model dl model anything so the output is a prediction so it will tell me either it is 0 to 9 if i use this 0 to 9 or if you use uh, your uh, iris it will tell me this iris centosa vergica all these three, three things it will tell 0 1 2 class three classes are there it will tell me this and if i use this fm nist data set it will tell me what it will tell me it is trouser slipper boot or what whatever is there footwear or whatever it is there so here it will tell me footwear so it will tell me the class so this is the prediction so we all know about we all know about the model input is there model is there right prediction is there how we do this using by training the model by giving it data which is input data and all these logic we know how to train test train set means what test set we have done so many things now what we try to word is this what is this model doing so this model is giving the class either it is telling this is a, a digit class or whether it is giving a trouser class so this is what it is telling so what i will try to do now is on similar analogy so see my analogy here what i try to tell here is so here i will try to give an example here so suppose i i give a cat i will tell a cat so my input example is a cat i have trained some model so my task is to tell it is cat or not a cat so it is a cat or not a cat so this when you are saying cat or not a cat what you are trying to do you are trying to build a boundary so this is cat class this is not cat class so here what you are going to see here you are going to say whether it is real whether it is really a cat or it is not a cat so it is fake so you are trying to say it is a fake so here we are going to build a boundary here which is going to tell us real whether it is really the exact word whatever was there here whether it is real or not real so kind of two class uh, like two class classification so yesterday he has also professor bernie has also told about you about a one class classifier he has also told about a one class classifier so here my problem is binary so i'll tell whether this is yes or no so obviously if i want to train this discriminator what what data should i give here to the discriminator anybody could unmute and tell me what i should give to discriminator to train this model
nobody what i should give this data for this problem cat you can put in the chat box if you have issues so to the model which is called a discriminator model what should be your inputs is my question Answers. Uh, to the discriminator model to train, what should be your inputs? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry for that. Maybe classes. Yeah, classes are your outputs, but what you should give as inputs? You should obviously give a classes. It is supervised. Correct. Whatever you are saying, supervised it is. But along with that, what you should give? I think I got something on this. Some data set. Yeah. Both okay. So I think he has told CFR data set. So CFR data set is what he sold, said. I think there is some disturbance. Can you unmute? Can you mute, please? So can somebody who is, uh, I think there is some uh, di like disturbance. Participants, please mute. Or else I'll have to remove. Okay. So here, what we are trying to uh, uh, tell you here is, we want to put you in this. If you want to put cat, then you have to give it data. I'm just writing here, you have to give it data and start training this. And I think one of the participants told CFR data set. So here data set is important for discriminator. And you should tell the labels as he said, because it's a supervised problem. You should do this. So suppose we now take a discriminator model. It's a model. We give input training data and it will tell yes or no, yes or no, binary classification. So we understand this. So we understand this discriminator is nothing but a supervised classification. What we have been doing with the MNIST, et cetera. But here, it's a binary classification, real or fake only. Here, you don't have to say 1,000 examples. Cat, dog, uh, this cat, this tiger, lion. You don't need to say this. So here, first part would be the discriminator would be a supervised classifier. The discriminator would be a supervised classifier. Right? But we are we know that GANs, whatever we are learning, is an unsupervised thing. So you should generate. This is, you see, the word generative is there. It is a generator. So you should be able to generate new things. So now you have to build a model where you should generate example. Right? So what you are going to give here is, here I am going to give some, some, uh, some, something here like this. So I just write it here to make it more simpler. I try to write digits. I wrote like this. I wrote like this. Okay. So this, this model, I will, uh, uh, some vector I will give like this to the model generator model. This generator model will see this. It will sit quiet. Why? Doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. Then what I do, I do, I give this another vector like this, where I give Right, like this, I go on giving vectors, random vectors here, random input vectors like this. So here at one point, I give like this. Generator keeps on seeing this. It is observing these inputs. It is observing these inputs. They are all random. They are all random. And it is all going on seeing. And once it sees this, it sees lot and lot of lot of samples like this. After you know that it will say that all these writings are like this. And if I take average of all these people, it will be something like five. So it will start generating five. It will look at like this. I have just shown three. You may have thousands, right? Randomly, you can go on giving anything. Suppose you want to give digits, you can go on giving it. So what is the possibility digits you will give? You will give between zero and nine only. You can't give faces here. So if this problem is for MNIST, 
you can't give faces here to the generator so you will go on giving either like this or you will go like this you have someone like this here you will write like this so this may be eight we don't know right so then you may give zero like this you may go on giving some random inputs generator will keep on observing that so what is being given so it will start learning so unsupervised learning please recall what we have done yesterday rice and dal we have classified how you know it is rice and how you know it's dal that's we unsupervised na lot of data i'll see i'll see that is a lot of in the vessel there is a lot of rice and dal mixed up i'll invert it and then see how to separate similarity it will also see that eight is not similar to five it will also see then it will say eight is something like this so if i want to generate eight then i should not apply the same technique what i use for five it will also do that it's a generator it's a generator it will generate it will generate data based on its understanding what is its understanding distance measures we have seen yesterday distance what are the distance l1 distance l2 distance right euclidean norm what this uh, this norm that norm whatever mathematical norm it will build it it will understand generator so i have a vector random input vector my generator sees all these inputs learns all the things then it starts generating an example so it is in this case it should generate 0 to 9 whatever example i have given thrown here but it can generate anything you can go on giving it examples of cats okay it can go on giving cats it will take different varieties of cat it will see cat is something like this so then it will build mustache then it will build this nose then eyes which is like this okay fur which is like this it will generate a cat are we getting this so how it does it via unsupervised learning and we have done both of this earlier supervised learning will do it with regard to earlier when we started unsupervised learning we did yesterday with regard to auto encoders so it is a generator so we are going to generate some samples so now what i do here is i try to bring these two people together see what i am trying to do so if you see i am just using this here one line i put like this you see this this is the generator part so this is my generator generator r a t u r generator so who is this generator unsupervised unsuper i'll write un s u n s u p unsupervised see this below part this is a discriminator so this is a discriminator discriminator i'll write fully first time discriminator who is this person he is supervised so this person is supervised s u p i supervised so what is the input for supervised you require two inputs whatever is the generated this whatever is generated i give one input here so see my arrow mark whatever is the real data real data it will take is one more arrow mark then this discriminator will see this generated example so suppose this was dog suppose this was dog here suppose it was dog suppose this real example was cat suppose it was cat what it will do dog and cat dog and cat it will see are they same so it is to give real or fake so dog dog means it is real cat cat means it is real so it will tell it is fake so who is wrong here amongst these two people generator and discriminator who did mistake generator generator did the mistake so we are going to up see the line we are going to go here and tell the generator are baba apne mistake kiya hai you should have put a cat you have put a dog go and change So update again. Neural network will do this. So next time, what he will do? He will next time this will update. So I'll just erase this. So this some some cats look like dogs, obviously, right? So what will he says? He will start generating again. So immediately he will not generate dog. Ah, uh, sorry, cat. He 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 has generated dog, right? So all his random input vectors need to be changed. 
generator model needs to be tuned suddenly he will not generating cat no he will now see this is fake let me give one more variety of one more variety which will make so the error here will be large or the loss here will be very large i have to reduce the loss that's what we learned in neural network so what we do he does he tries to bring a dog so i write this as dog prime dog prime which is more near nearby a cat but still this discriminator is happily telling fake fake he will again go and gen, go and do change this until these two people become cat so the role of discriminator is to tell this person here but the discriminator also may be wrong the discriminator may also be wrong uh, here the generator may be generating something where the discriminator may fail we we know na we know that supervised classification can be attacked you can attack this and you can tell the discriminator wrong things easily so this may also actually it is fake it may say output label so then you have to update the discriminator also so you have to correct this person also how you can do this back propagation so now it's an interesting game by a generator and a discriminator it is nothing but an attack and a defender generator is attacking it's an attack launched it's an attack launch discriminator's job is going to be a defender he is going to be a defender he is going to defend against that attack this defender and both are going to correct themselves generator model is going to correct themselves as well as discriminator model is going to correct itself okay this game if it runs it is called generative adversarial networks let's see how it goes let take a uh, let's take noise let's generate let's go on generating numbers faces etc give it to generator generator goes on see the generator is generating they are not actually written 0 1 2 3 or faces are not actually there they are not real they are all fake from from noise they are going to find out for form right this is from noise it is coming generator is generating all these are fake images of 0 1 2 3 4 it is generated just like you write us in olden days you are writing c code to make an aeroplane as one of our participants told so it is something like this you are generating something this code is to write a generator but now but now this discriminator this one of the inputs is going to the discriminator and whatever is real images is going to discriminator discriminator is a supervised network it will check whether the real or fake if it is fake it has to if it is fake it has to update someone if it is real but it is told some fake it has to update somebody else so this goes through the training cycle this is how we start training we take real world images we take real world we give it discriminator sees sees this from the generator it takes this samples this loss function is calculated then the either it will be a real or a fake right so accordingly whoever is real whoever fake you need to back propagate the error and correct this person so either you have to update the discriminator depending on this label or you have to update the generator so here while training you have to either do this okay or try to change the generator depending on anybody so when you are doing this you can't do simultaneously both so that is why lock sign is shown here so when you are lock the generator you are updating the discriminator weights by propagating there and when you are doing the discriminator uh, updating the generator you are going to lock the discriminator okay so you are going to train the discriminator and train the generator now this training will go on see this my real data is horses my real data is horses this is my generator this is the random input here this is the random input here generator suppose it gives other than a horse you suppose it gives cat okay real or fake so see the yellow line and see the red line yellow is for discriminator then the other color i think it is uh, sorry uh, blue is for discriminator orange color is for the generator so go on doing this go on iterating this it will take lot of time update generator update here see it is over are we getting this 
so this kind of game if it is being played between the generator and discriminator then it is all the such kind of networks are called gams generative adversarial networks because one is trying it is a cat and mouse it's a cat and mouse every time the discriminator wants to update itself to do proper classification generator want to confuse it and vice versa okay so this kind of game is being played between these two so here let us see this gan notebooks so i here discard this so let us go to this uh, generative adversarial networks uh, i think we have it here so i think we'll just put this off down this was my auto encoders so i'll bring my gan notebooks so this is how it has loaded for me i go back here we have put lot of images so yeah from here it's very interesting example so let us see whether we can go at so there are various types of gans there are various types of gans here i think i'll reload this notebook it has not loaded properly or else i'll try to open it on colab and not run it but show you it takes lot of time because these are heavy notebooks sometimes they load properly on github sometimes they throw an exception so if they throw an exception again let us go and again load a colab notebook so i go here copy this path i go to github i put it here i open this let me check if it runs with regard to kaggle whether it can bring it if it is running then it is good i think it is not bringing this animal face dataset because there is some load error with this file so it's not unzipping in time so let us go to this face database at least so see look i just increase the font size here this is what i was telling earlier so here i think this is also shown on my this part there is some load error let me put it on yeah here it is come now it has come so this is how it generates so i'm going through this overview of the gan uh, i think uh, students have used our uh, pytorch pytorch they have used you can also use tensor flow okay so here what is the task of gan before going into deep gan what is this gan whatever i told on my ppt 
it's a generative adversarial network generative means it should have two parts generator to generate data and how does it take the data okay take the data from noise vector and the discriminator which is a uh, which is an supervised part and which is trying to do what tell whether generated is correct or not by comparing it with real data so here and obviously you have to update these two people so you have to use a loss function so here see suppose i want to say distinguish currency right so this is my generated data somebody did like this obviously this is real data is uh, this is like this here on the right hand side you have the note of in on the note you have abraham lincoln right so here it is not so so it will tell this is fake this is not correct then you do this you go on generating this it says fake every time who wins here who wins here the discriminator wins it is able to successfully defend the generator right but what happens now slowly this person will go on correcting slowly this person will go on correcting and see that okay what is why is he telling like this and every time he will start generating right generator goes well and this it will start generating something like this both are real so now this this is generated like this generated generator went on it will take lot of training cycles i think few initially it takes lot of lot of time goes on generating gives all possible things then it says that no it start coming nearby when it start coming nearby this generator starts coming nearby discriminator fails it will tell this is fake it will start telling this is real it is real okay so this is a game played between the discriminator and the discriminator and the generator so how does a gan look this is what i showed you real images are given generator is generate generator has never seen the real images it is only seeing the loss my loss is not reducing so what i should do i should do something better than that how will i reduce if it increase then it will not go in that direction it will go in the direction to decrease so it will go on decreasing decreasing till the point both remain same then the discriminator will find difficulty in telling whether it is real or fake so here both they are playing a game here both are neural networks and they are playing a game so let's use the library how to do it that's what is our task so you have to open, bring this is written in torch so he is pytorch so he has written pytorch code for importing this bring all this see this is random how to generate you may say what is noise vector here so this is random integers between 1 to 10000 you use this and you see it will start generating it will start generating so let's see how to do this here so this is your batch size so some some data set he has taken he has taken animal faces here the, and he has changed a few parameters epochs he has kept here okay then he has he is going on defining the transformation then he is going on defining the transformation so what happens here when we go on to do this it will take a lot of time so here when we go in this it will take a lot of time here so it is able to distinguish whether it is real or fake fake so define these libraries bring this stuff then you take this data so you load this image resize this load this bring it here plot these training images so this is training images animal faces so this is some cartoon faces which he has used this is the data set which is already available we have not done this right if you write animal faces data set it is already available so take this data set training images i'll just reduce the size i think it's looking blown off yeah now it is okay so here i'll just put this how to implement weight initialization we start with the we start with zero any just random distribution so you start from any normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 0.02 to the generator then you start keep a loss function so here loss batch normalization criteria and start this training procedure weight initialization you will start something like this then we build the generator we have to build the generator this is a generator so you use this is the generator here it is showing here generator again convolution networks convolution networks here no there is no you note here there is no pooling only convolution networks 
you bring out a convolution network you come out and generate a generator this is a generator code class generator module definitely you cannot train on your cpu we require gpu to do this so here we use gpu come into this right apply create the generator then you apply the weights print the model the generator looks something like this this is your generator model these are the uh, layers here so which he has shown then you build the discriminator so build the discriminator here opposite discriminator here like this it should tell whether it is real or fake that's the job of this so this is a discriminator module it's a supervised so here you will have uh, convolution and your relu so you will have this so this he has put it here now create the discriminator just like you created the generator create the discriminator show the discriminator this is the discriminator model these are the discriminator models right then you start this game take the before taking the starting the game you should uh, select the loss functions select the loss functions and optimizers so here this is the loss many loss functions are there he has taken some examples of these loss so take this loss function then start training so now when you train this it will take lot of lot of time on gpu so this is real data what he has run this is the gif that he has shown what i had taken in my slide okay train the generator oh, sorry train the discriminator first back propagate then come down right then go and do it for uh, the generator you did for a discriminator first then you go and do for gen down that is the, the generator then you do this training then you play this game with the test data so these are the things that we do so you could use this notebook at your own uh, part is very large notebook because gans are not simple so you start the training loop so here this is how the loss so there are two loss here so please note one loss is for the uh, discriminator the other loss is for the generator so whatever is written d is for discriminator loss and what is for g is for the generator loss go on through the loop so we go through the loop like this he has shown few unless and until this goes on and on and on and here you go this so this is shown here and finally we have to see whether well, let's check out what we did and look at different results so let's look at this let first we look at how dng losses so every time machine learning after training plot the losses for generator and discriminator both i think you are able to see this if not i can increase the font yeah so i think you see this we see the dng losses so put the loss curve second we put it on the we visualize the generator output to see whether it is okay or not third we look for the real output of the this whether it is able to work so uh, yeah so it is giving me a warning that you are connected to a gpu runtime but you are not using the gpu i am not running it so it is giving me a warning here so coming down i go through this this is how we plot so i just cancel this i'll reduce the size so this is my generator and discriminator losses so g is in your blue color d is in yellow color so this is how we reduce this is how we reduce come down visualization of the generator's progression right so this kind of you get this so real versus fake grab a batch of real images and you test it whether it is okay or not so here you see this is the left hand side both will start outputting same okay so this is how your gans work so i am giving you this particular uh, notebook it's i think seminar underscore gan where we have used this it is practically impossible to train this in the time what we have even if you have gpu it takes lot lot of time okay and but we we can save these weights and reuse these weights so i'm just sh stop sharing for uh, 5 minutes to ask you uh, if this game is understood so there is a game between supervised classification and unsupervised classification 
so uh, and who is first generator is on top and discriminatory is bottom both are playing this game one is trying to outsmart the other how via back propagation it may be back propagation it may be any of this it should be able to go back change the weights and again come back see the loss go back see the loss do this iteration go through this iteration so gans are very very important gans nowadays i think i have seen at least i have seen gans defeating all the uh, face recognizers it has defeated it is generated so many people who do not exist okay it's a generator finally it's a generator so it has generated faces so it has used it has been used at many many places gans itself if you go and collect over a period gan came somewhere in i think 2014 like that from good fellow from that work and gan is still existing today now different types of gans have come dc gan a uh, deep convolution gans then all suffixes have been added to gans but all uh, funda remains the same it is nothing but if i share my screen again don't forget this model the model is this model is what it exactly it is it is going to be here it is going to be a generator a game between a generator and a discriminator my own uh, so phd supervisor uh, is very active in this area published uh, his students have published lot of gan related works generative adversarial networks related works and uh, they have shown it to improvement of super resolution blurry images you want to bring unblurred images that has defeated all our classical machine learning so it has defeated all classical machine learning based approaches it has defeated hand hand crafted feature based approaches you want to do uh, image enhancement video enhancement so it has been applied at different different places so gans is one example and different types of gans are there we won't go into that i'll give you some resource once i finish my class i'll give you some resource but you have to understand only one thing this is what is the logic though it is written in an inverted fashion looks good but this is what exactly it is for an understanding point of view you should know that it consists of these two parts so you can think this this is not the right way of thinking but for your understanding instead of remembering all this you can say this is unsupervised and this is supervised so it's a game being played between an unsupervised person a generator who is not seen this he is only seeing this generator is only seeing the loss which is propagating he is only he is not this random input vectors are not seeing the real images see there is no connection between these two huh? these two are not connected please uh, see the difference these are not connected then there is no use of this network okay so then there is no use of this particular network if there is connections they have not seen each other but what is what is the generator seeing generator is only seeing this loss whether loss is large or small okay whether loss is large or small so you should only remember this from an angle that you have a generator so generator is should come first then your discriminator should come similarly here if you see the below part obviously your generator is first real data discriminator training is easy but what generator is generating and so who learns more here more learning is for the generator to do more job is for the generator to learn properly and feed a input to the discriminator so that the discriminator fails and discriminator's job is there however good the generator generates the output it is my job to tell it is fake because the discriminator should always output so i am just putting a Uh, here discriminator should always tell it is fake for the generator output it should always tell it is fake if it starts telling it is real if uh, it is it starts telling it is real then generator is successful in fooling the discriminator so again it is a zero sum game being played but again you can model this using game theory you can model this using game theory. are we getting this any doubts with regard to this let me know here before we go because i want to spend some time apart because we have done so many collab notebooks etc today is the last session for me and i have some time available with sharing my research experience 
so this is the last part what we are doing so but we are doing it with gans attacking gans is is again a research problem so people who are listening to me who want to do some research etc you can also think about uh, working on gans or you can ask your if your faculty or your some uh, researcher etc you can ask your group to work on gans gan data is majorly available everywhere i'll give you the resources all the resources okay but you should understand the underlying concept okay so with this i think i'll just end it here with regard to i'll discard this and i'll open it up for questions before we go to some other part let's keep it open for some questions yeah please go ahead with questions can use your chat box any questions here yeah uh, our all our notebooks are shareable i think ankan is putting this question so whether uh, all our parts are shareable um because is there any application in the speech uh, is are there any application in which area no you have shown uh, in the image processing yeah yeah about audio audio oh yeah okay yeah yeah i'll i'll tell that audio okay i'll tell i'll tell. yeah so i have two questions one is with regard to sharing my resource yes obviously you can think that i'll share everything so you would have got all my slides uh, all professor bernie slides early morning also you would have been getting it that's how it is and you will always get mine also all these notebooks we have only not given you earlier because it's public you can edit somebody edits it wrongly then it doesn't work on the day of the workshop it is getting recorded so it doesn't look good so that's why i have not shared as soon as my session finishes here i'll send the mail and go back okay definitely that uh, will then you edit to edit whatever you do you do okay that is always you can download and put it you can always use it so whatever i have told across these days these are available on my youtube channel if you have any issues it's you can always go through it again and however i have told run it again and again we are reachable via email you can always email so this is with regard to ankan what he asked with regard to dr vishwanath what he says with regard to the areas where we have where we have uh, we can apply i haven't told it earlier because we fix this to be uh, uh, adversarial uh, um, uh, this signal processing with regard to machine and deep learning so i have not told you the application domains as he said we'll go now i have some time so we'll go now to the domains where it can be applied so he's asked us about speech so we'll go into not only speech we can go into different domains where gans are available so any other questions i'll just wait for a minute so before we go on to other parts okay so let us if you have any questions so let us go into those i'm just opening up the applications so mean meanwhile uh, if there are any examples you can yeah so i think there are no more questions so let's go to the application as we asked uh, gans whether it can uh, go for speech answer is yes it can go for speech it can uh, uh, speaker recognition so whatever i think people who have worked from uh, either any of these uh, places where they have done research know that every electronics or computer science department has a has an image processing group in our institute also we have cs ec e has an image processing group it has a speech recognition group which people work on speech audio and all that it has a video analytics group some people are overlapping on many places it has a video analytics group where we do uh, 
video analytics based research uh, so obviously yes there are uh, applications people have already used gans for speech audio uh, video and all that so i'll just show you one of the areas where i'll just share my screen again and show you what and all it can do so only thing we should understand is we should sometimes understand what it can't do okay so that is an uh, uh, funny way of telling it so this is you can go through this uh, machine learning mastery blogs so different uh, he has given different uh, applications 18 applications he has given right so here if you are having uh, see generally let us come to what it was it was basically coming from image processing all the cnn etc came from image processing because as we saw lee lee kun started somewhere in 98 with a mnist data set please go back to the history of cnn it started from there so obviously it started from imaging and now it is applied everywhere but major focus has been in imaging in the sense it has been in the imaging computer vision community or with regard to stegno uh, this steg analysis or with regard to video analytics majorly but what are the things you can do you can generate example data sets i will go through one among all of these have been given you can generate few photographs of human faces you can uh, do cartoon generations image to image translation text to image translation i'll tell you what exactly they are text to then you can do frontal view generation photos to emojis photograph editing you can also take a photograph of yourself now and let's see 20 years later how you look how you may look so face aging super resolution in paint super resolution in painting professor uh, uh, i think professor biswas group has done at kharagpur and uh, a video prediction it can do 3d object generation you can go on doing any generative sort of right and uh, we'll go to speech also so you can see few examples right uh, generate examples from image data set so you can go on generating if you face anywhere any problem right you want to generate a new things use gan so you can if you have data set issue use gan to generate data set so these are the data sets which gans have generated it has helped so here you are you can see indoor environment right bedroom taken uh, this Uh, different photographs so architecture you can give it as architecture study so you want to generate uh, these people right man with glasses man without glasses so if you take this minus without glasses plus if you do woman then you will get woman with glasses right so you take um, somebody's photos with photographs so take their own photographs without wearing the spectacles add it a woman wearing spectacles you'll start getting strange results and they are not actual people you may get some different people generating photographs of human faces so these people many of these people do not many exist but here if you go on seeing there may be people who may not exist okay so this is one among them so here i'll just quickly go through this next is uh, object and scenes you can generate 3d you can generate right then you can generate uh, realistic photographs of scenes cartoon characters i think we use this animal face data set just now this is the data set which i showed you it is there japanese data set here here all these image to image translation okay semantic meaning today is night this this image na you don't need uh, somebody to tell that this is image of a city image of a city directly it will see it will sell city image then you don't need to say well, this is traffic it will go on telling the text out of it it will translate this so translation of semantic images to photographs of city and bad this translation of uh, satellite photographs to google maps translation of photos from day to night so if you take a photograph in day same photograph how you you don't need to wait for the night to happen it will you can use gan and see how it will look in night okay sketches to color photograph black and white photograph you have your old photographs they are black and white your parents grandparents you want to make it color today's world you want to make it look with the same people use can so translation of black and white photographs to color 
what is what you could do right so like this you can generate 3d here you can generate uh, text so here input right so here examples for uh, four image translation classes so you can translate images many many examples are there so you can make the blur image so text to text translation you can do you give this you give this it will start telling text this image is taken for a red bird with these many feathers it is sitting on a on a on a it is its beak is like this okay its color is like this it will start giving you text text it's an it's an image and if you give vice versa draw a bird with red color big this much if you tell in la human language it will start drawing who will do it gan okay vice versa also text to image you can do you can say text it will start generating image so you can tell now make me a living room with sofa on the left hand side a table on the right hand side a chair on the a, a monitor on the table a laptop on the table it will make it right so this is what is called translation see now see here this bird, small bird has pink this and crown and black primary and secondary is magnificent all you tell this it will start drawing so we are entering bad territory because you may do anything with gans right so you may do anything with gans and you can use it for bad purposes also and semantic image to photo translation you can do so we will not go into all this face frontal view generation generating new human faces they may not have existed photos to emojis you want to make emojis means whatever we use a smiley or thumbs up or thumbs down emojis they are called so you can make photos to emojis so again gans you can edit photographs just like you have your adobe photoshop for editing you can use gan to do this you can change the color you can you can do it in useful applications like for example you want to go for a, uh, this you have uh, discovered that you have eyesight problem you have been recommended by some uh, number for your eye and then you want to wear a frame you want to choose a frame so you give your face gans will put different frames and tell you how you may look so based on that you may choose you don't need to go and stand in front of mirror and put all that and see how it looks so you can do it so you can make some a real person blonde bang smile change the hair style you can do use it at different different places like this same person different views okay see this all these are papers in vision so these is out of and face aging take a face image of yourself you see how you may appear after so many years right so that again age progression these are all the gan based method de aging and all these parts you can read these papers it is always there blending you want to mix up two photos forensics you want to blend right blend these two and bring a new photograph you can do that so like this super resolution means you want to make a better remove the blur so that is what you want to do so infinite so my class won't stop it will go for long we don't want to go here so you have some dark area here it is removed you want it to be restored in painting so you can in paint from the neighbors and you can get get back clothing so you now know amazon and uh, all these people what they are using so clothing it looks on how it videos so this is video prediction so how it may look so these are few i'll go through quick okay so here so these are gans again everybody goes to ian goodfellow so it goes to goodfellow's paper so i just reconnect you go to goodfellow's uh, blog so if you go this with the uh, goodfellow's uh, this he is available online and uh, if you go to his google scholar his web is uh, available home page you can go to his home page here everything is there okay so all the uh, this part whatever you do you can go there and you can take it 
so this is one among the researchers who are active in this so not only him there are other people also so i think you can just google oxford vision group so it is visual geometry group university of oxford so you can go here this is what vgg net so you got this vgg net right so we have used i think i have shown you vgg net so vgg net comes from somewhere here so you have all their people publication research projects right you can see their data so all these data sets for sign language audio visual i think uh, dr vishwanath was asking me speaker identification so this is the group which works on this data set so dr vishwanath please note you can you go to speaker identity or whatever you are using then if you have a face recognition vision problem yeah yeah no. yeah so you can go for face if you have you are working on videos right so you have all these data sets accordingly whoever this uses the data set have to go through these publications so and the de demos are available as well as many times they keep their data set as well as demos as well as code online in terms of vgg so here you can see speaker if you say speaker so here you could see you can go to the pdf of this speaker okay spot the converse speaker so here it is applied on all this deep speaker recognition if you go to this go to the data so here it is zizerman's group andrew zizerman i was talking about earlier so data he, he is a regular visitor in india's icvjp conference so if you have been there icvjp you would have met uh, zizerman so works large audio visual data set of human speech so he has these many people these many utterances and these many hours and you can download this this trained weights models also you can use right and if you use them you give them a citation that you, you give them an acknowledgement they throw a challenge also every time you can participate if you are a vision researcher or a speech researcher you can always use all these resources so oxford's vgg group is one then you can go to google brain this is another research group so you can go and see google brain so this is the research group which is reading your gmails okay i'm just making fun <laughs> okay so you can go to the group google brain team so you see what they are doing and uh, who are the researchers similarly you can see others this is one more machine intelligence group so you can go through their publications i think it's loading yeah daily they publish they are very big group so they publish many many papers etc right tools and out uh, downloads so if you have you want any of their so deep model generalization open images you want any of their data sets take it from this audio audio set comprehensive sound ontology or 600 sound classes 2 million 10 second youtube clips all this so text national this uh, sorry natural language processing also they do and they are the people who have written tensor flow they are the people who are youtube they are the people who are having github they are the people who are give, given us collab okay so here in india this this google brain so in india if you come so you can go to microsoft india research group it's a research group in bangalore so here again you can go to this microsoft india research for indian researchers you can go here and you can see what are the works that they are doing here this is our research group here who is leading this what kind of research they are doing right uh, so it is uh, sriram rajmani uh, who is heading this group earlier it was p anandan so now it is sriram rajmani who is uh, leading this research group so you can also go through the algorithms and all this uh, machine learning and ai with regard to them so this is with regard to the research group in india then like this there are many many researchers i don't know i have 10 minutes more it's 
uh, here then uh, this is the microsoft group like this you have the apple group uh, again i won't go into all that uh, basically here my then i think i should have told you um, yeah i think at iic bangalore you have this uh, uh, this research group of venkatesh babu so you can go through his home page he works on in this kind of research you can go through his publications we happened to meet in i uh, at iit uh, guwahati and in 2016 we happened to meet in 2013 at ncv prith ji jodhpur so you can so you could, if i just increase this again they are the people who give their code so you could see self gated memory recurrent neural networks right so this is again code is available right so here pattern this is again locate size so i think operator in a loop i think gans if i write gans here generative so here gan tree if you re see incremental learning hierarchical generative framework for multimodal distribution right dli gan limited cvpr so you can go through these people's so this is one more indian researcher who is active in this area of uh, gans imaging and uh, video analytics and all this stuff so you can go through uh, this part and of course there are many many researchers i won't get all time to tell you all that but i have told you majorly the people who are working in this in india in uh, uh, outside so we should use their data set so that it is easier for easier for us to do the research so i think i'll stop share here i think if you can have any questions we can just take for we have around 10 minutes left so or is or is broadly i have finished but if you have any questions you want me to tell more i would have forgotten because all of this is coming spontaneous so i would have forgotten so let me take some time is something important to be told then i can always tell any questions yeah i think we have okay resources you are thanking me good right but i want any question so uh, you may have one question how to start and all that so maybe general questions are there how do you start research in doing all this Uh, so you should be see passionate about research that's what i tell in all of my uh, talks or my workshops if you are not passionate then please don't do research that's what i always say uh, don't take it up as a uh, don't take it up as a, either a hobby that i do research when my, when i get free time or i do it for sake of doing it to get some whatever uh, job or salary or whatever if you if you are doing it for that purpose then you are a wrong person doing research right you should not do that for you will obviously get some job you obviously get some uh, uh, posts and all that will come when you go through you should be passionate enough towards learning so if you are uh, uh, if you are having passion towards research maybe you are hand doing handcrafted research maybe you are doing deep learning based research maybe you are doing in any area you are doing not only in our area any if you are not passionate and if you do not have that passion that you uh, yes i'll contribute something small somebody else sitting somewhere will read and i will get acknowledgement they may not give but i i may get acknowledgement they may cite my name if this is your then research is your cup of tea you should do research if you do really like to make yourself known that it should not allow you to sleep that you should get that okay today i'll finish this and go because i have to finish i am passionate about getting this results but if you only tell me that i have i am going to get uh, i want to do research because i'll get some result publish some paper right then go and gets because of getting some job i'll publish some paper then don't do research right so you can take my own example i give my own example right so i am not a very big researcher here uh, i don't have that many number of citations nor do i have that many number of long papers nor that big research group right but whatever small things i do i make it sure that it is done complete i finish the task i publish it in good fairly good venues 
i network it i pass it on to my students and they are benefited by that and uh, at the end of the day the day ends how does it affect whether you are having 100 people 200 people doesn't matter you should be passionate that uh, you whatever you are get doing you are doing it for incremental knowledge and that knowledge will remain like that right so either published somebody will read it somebody will ask you something via email you will reply you will give your data set you will feel nice at the end of the day that yes somebody got benefited so if if that is your task if that is your motivation then you should be doing research but doing research for the sake of getting some things right so that is always bad putting a time limit for getting research that i should finish it in this work i'll finish in 10 days right in 10 days my result did not come what i will do all these things are if you are passionate results will come and uh, you have to believe that okay i am doing results come doesn't come doesn't matter sometimes what happens we work we do not get i think my own students who have worked if they publish three papers they come they came up with eight proposals where their work was not better they did not publish that eight they did not they only published three or two right that seven eight went away but that is how is research because the result is not significant in comparison to state of art nobody will read it nobody will it is, the results are not reproducible nobody will use it right so what we try to say do something small do something small significant it should be small but it should be significant in the sense that it should increase knowledge and while doing that you may lose something because you may not come up with a good uh, algorithm i myself have left half of my if i have published five four five papers during my phd i have left around seven eight like that forgot i know i have i have not forgotten okay but i know that they do, nobody will read that kind of thing so i have not published right so i have not uh, come uh, decrease the quality and come somewhere else just for publication i'll publish here go i have big chain no because further when i am asked i cannot defend that work so whatever work i do i can defend whether it is small i am a small person we will do small work like that so research many many researchers ask me whenever we go for talks or we go visit conferences we they ask about all this so don't be worried about research be passionate about research so that's what is my concluding remark and uh, what is the criteria for good classifier is there any benchmark no there is no criteria as such it all depends on your application so we have used classifiers for application but you may also design your own classifiers so you may modify your own classifiers to generate something new so you may see gan or you may have an idea that okay can i do this and uh, improve gan then it will be your own gan so add some word and write ga so that will be your own so you may either theoretically work so what professor bernie is doing is theoretically working he is mathematically strong so he is working theoretically major part in india we are working on applications so we take this gan apply on satellite data we take this gan apply on video data we take it for in painting we take it for object generation we are doing like that but you can go the other way also theoretical also you can go and you can there is no such criteria it all depends on experience so if you are more experienced you know what to use where okay so i think it is done from my side any other questions last concluding notes if there is any we'll take or else we'll close shortly okay then i think it is done from my side so uh, on a concluding remark i would like to thank all of you for having joined today and this is the last day for my session today will be today evening will be professor bernie at around 5:30 so he will be speaking on backdoor attacks and some benign and how to come out uh, of those uh, defenses it is new for me also so we are also going into that part so let me uh, uh, know even i'll be uh, joining that and understanding what exactly is saying so if you have any things you can always if you felt something here you couldn't ask or share please put me email to that lab uh, uh, gmail which is sending you this you can send you can send me the email and we will be happy to answer all these questions and uh, so just a reminder that we meet today at uh, 5:30 in the evening and this will be the last day for the gyan uh, course so with this i thank you for joining today and uh, we hope that you have enjoyed this sessions and obviously the uh, notebooks will be shared 
and all the credit of making the notebook goes to my student team whoever i have showed you so those are the people behind this generating this all these models and full lab sessions and all that part so with this i thank you again i am leaving the meeting assigning someone my administrator as the host and we'll meet in the second half at 5:30 so thank you for joining bye bye
ಸಿಗಸಿ <laughs> 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 ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ <laughs> ಶ್ರೀಲಕ್ಷ್ಮಿ ದಿಲೀಪ್ ನಾವು ಸರ್ ರಮಣ್ರ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಎಂತವರೆಗೂ ವಚ್ಚಿನ ಚೆಪ್ಪಂಡ್ ಏನೇನ್ ಒಕ್ಕೊಕ್ಕ ಪ್ಯಾರಾಮೀಟರ್ ಅದಿಪ್ರಮ ಅದು ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಒಂದು ತರಗತಿ ಮೂರು ವರ್ಷ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನು ನೈನ್ಟೀನು ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಆರ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟೀನ್ ಆರ್ ನೈನ್ಟೀ
ಮತ್ತ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಟೂ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಟೂ ಸರ್ ಸಿಮಿಲರ್ ಟು ಲೆಸನ್ ಪ್ಲಾನ್ಸ್ ಉಂಟಲ್ಲಿ ಕರಿಕ್ಯುಲಮ್ ಗ್ಯಾಪ್ಸ್ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಫೈ ಚೇಸ್ತಾರಾ ಅಲ್ಲಿಗೆ ಕಂಟೆಂಟ್ ಬಿ ಆನ್ ಸಿಲೆಬಸ್ ಅದೇ ಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಉಂಟದು ಐ ಸಿ ಓ ಪಿ ವರ್ಸ್ ಕಟ್ ಮೇ ಆ ಇದೊಂದು ಡಿಸೈನ್ ಇದೆ ಸಿಓಸ್ ಆಲ್ರೆಡಿ ಡಿಫೈನ್ಡ್ ಕರ್ ಸರ್ ಸಿಲೆಬಸ್ ಕಟ್ ಮಾಡೋಣ ಸರ್ ಕ್ರಾಸ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಫಾಲೋ ಚೇಸ್ತಾ ಅಂತ ಡೆಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಯಾವ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಎಲ್ಲೋ ನಿಂತಿ ರಾವಲ ಉದ್ದಾನದಿ ಅದೇ ಕಿರಣ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಅಂತ ಸಿಲೆಬಸ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಏಟ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಏಟ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಕಿ ಸಬ್ಮಿಟ್ ಚೇಸರ್ ಅಂತ ಸರಿ ಏಟ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಮಿಟಾಲ್ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡಿಸ್ತಾ ಅಂತ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಅವರ್ ಬೆಟರ್ ಮಾಡೋಣ ಲ್ಯಾಬ್ ಲೋ ಪ್ರತಿ ಡಿಫರೆಂಟ್ ಫೋಟೋಸ್ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿಟ್ಟಾನು ಆ ಫೋಟೋಸ್ ಲೋ ಸಬ್ಮಿಟ್ ಚೇಸರ್ ಅಂತ ಏ ಎಲ್ ಎಟ್ ಆಗಿ ಏ ಸಂಧ್ಯಾ ಸಂ ಸೋ ಗೆಟ್ ಮೀ ಇನ್ ಅಕ್ಸರ್ ಕೌಂಟ್ ಚೇಸ್ಕೊಂಡೆ ಕೌಂಟ್ ಕೌಂಟ್ ಸಬ್ಮಿಟ್ ಚೇಸರ್ ಅಂತ ಲೇದಂತೆ ನಾನು ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಒಚ್ಚಿ ವರ್ಕ್ ಚೇಸ್ಕೊಂಡಿ ಎಲ್ಲೆಡೆ ಅಟೆಂಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಮಿನಿಟ್ ಐತೆ ಹಾರ್ಡ್ ಐತೆ ಏನೇ ಚೇಸರ್ ಐತೆ ಹ್ಮ್ ಏನೇ ಸರ್ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಏನೇ ಅಂತ ಡಿಕ್ ಸರ್ ಸೋ ಕಾ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ 2.1 ಇಂಪ್ರೂವ್ ಕ್ವಾಲಿಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಟೀಚಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದಾಂಟ್ಲೋ ಯು ನೀಡ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ದಿ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿಕ್ ಕ್ಯಾಲೆಂಡರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಲೆಸನ್ ಪ್ಲಾನ್ಸ್ ಅದು ಇಚ್ಛೆ ದಾಂಟ್ಲೋ ನೀವು ಮಾಡ್ಯೂಲ್ ಕಾರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ 
స్టూడెంట్ నేమ్స్ అక్కడ మీకు ఇయర్ టైటిల్స్ ఇచ్చేసి మ్యాపింగ్ విత్ పిఎస్ఓస్ అండ్ పిఓస్ అది అక్కడ రావాలి ప్రాజెక్ట్ కోఆర్డినేటర్ దగ్గర లిస్ట్ తీసుకోండి మీకు పిఓస్ పిఎస్ఓస్ పిఓస్ కామన్ గవర్నమెంట్ ఇచ్చేసి పిఎస్ఓస్ మీ డిపార్ట్మెంట్ ఉంటాయి రెండో మూడో ఉంటాయి దానికి రెలవెన్స్ రాయండి ఏ ఏ పిఎస్ఓ మ్యాప్ అవుతుంది అన్నది ఆ రెలవెన్స్ రాసేయండి అక్కడ మనీ చేసుకోవాలి సో జస్ట్ మీరు నంబర్ నెక్స్ట్ కొలాబరేటివ్ లర్నింగ్ అలాగే కరెంట్ బ్యాచ్ ఎస్ఐఆర్ లో అయితే కరెంట్ అంటే మన మన పాస్ట్ అవుట్ స్టూడెంట్స్ ఉంటది వాళ్ళు వచ్చేటప్పటికి ట్వంటీ టూ అయిపోవచ్చు అప్పుడు ట్వంటీ టూ కూడా చేసి పెట్టుకోవాలి తర్వాత మన ఇప్పుడు ప్రస్తుతం ఎస్ఐఆర్ కి ట్వంటీ ట్వంటీ వన్ ఇక్కడ ఎస్ఐఆర్ కి అవసరం లేదు బట్ డాక్యుమెంట్ అయితే చేయాలి ఇది చేస్తారు ల్యాబ్ చేస్తారా వాళ్ళకి మనం ఏం చేస్తున్నాం అవి మనం సెగ్రిగేట్ చేసుకోవాలని చేస్తాను ౌట్స్టాండింగ్ అంటే పైన ఇచ్చాను చూడండి దానిలో యూ కెన్ ఐడెంటిఫై వాట్ దే హ్యావ్ అవి కాకుండా మీ అప్పట్లో అవి తీసుకున్నాం ఇంకా ఎక్కువ ఉంటది నవ్ నవ్ దేవన్ కోర్స్ ఎడెక్స్ కోర్సెస్ ఆర్ మైక్రోసాఫ్ట్ సర్టిఫికేషన్ సిస్కో సర్టిఫికేషన్ చాలా ఉంటున్నాయి కదా ఎడ్యూ స్కిల్స్ ఉంటున్నాయి అవన్నీ మీరు ఇంక్లూడ్ చేసుకోవాలి అవన్నీ ఇంక్లూడ్ చేసుకుని వాళ్ళ దాంట్లో వాళ్ళ బెస్ట్ ఏది ఉందో అది అవుట్ సైడింగ్ ఫీచర్స్ లో ఇచ్చేయండి స్లో లెర్నర్స్ కి మనం రెమెడియల్ క్లాసెస్ పెట్టామా ఎక్స్ట్రా క్లాసెస్ పెట్టి స్టడీ హార్స్ కింద పెట్టామా అవన్నీ పెట్టి వాళ్ళని ఎలా ఐడెంటిఫై చేస్తా అనేది ఒక ఫ్లో చాట్ ఉంది అది మీకు డాక్యుమెంట్ పంపిస్తాను ఆ ఫ్లో చాట్ ఆ క్లాసెస్ ఉంటే అయిపోతుంది ఆ మెథడ్ ప్రకారం యూఆర్ ఐడెంటిఫైంగ్ ద స్టూడెంట్స్ అండ్ ఇట్స్ మీట్ బి అ కంటిన్యూస్ ప్రాసెస్ 
if, if, if they are not satisfied, next further again we are uh, doing the same process and that till we get a satisfactory result. Okay, next switch internal quality assessment question papers. Are we following green stacks on any? On that, man, general, on internal question papers, we are not like, writing the level of the blooms. blooms. So, I man, touch for any. Mali modify jadi tu cayaan sir. Yes, man. Man, yes sir. Meet children. Ante path question paper ante kan? Dan kalau extra, you need to write in what level, what level it is. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot of questions. Exams are going to be a lot इंटरनल पेपर सिस्टम या यूनिवर्सिटी बेपस के भी नहीं ना तुम्हारे यहाँ से लेवलेशन पर मन ब्लूम्स ले बैठे हैं जैसे बिजनेस आह भाई हाँ हाँ ओके ब्लूम्स बेपस की है तो तो मैंने टाइम नहीं रहता रखते नहीं रहता टाइम क्या होता है So, and then you need to have a committee, examination committee, academic committee members. But department-wise exams are coordinated sooner. Exams are coordinated sooner. Question paper, me, 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 a committee with the faculty. Yeah. Then strategy one more. Complete 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 strategy one more. Com मन इधेडी सीनियर फैकल्टी मेबर्स एक्सपर्ट मेबर <laughs> आते हैं सेहत के लिए मार्डिपार्टमेंट के लोग ना हाँ आल आल कार्य करते हैं आदि आदि मेरे पास या कार्य पावरिंग तो आल दे ही रहता है ना पर अलग इंटरन में तो कार्य का स्ट्रक्चर दे ही रहता है ना सर गुड इवनिंग सर 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 ये कंपनी का भी नेक्स्ट शेयर चल रहा है सर कुछ रिफ्रेंस कर सकते हैं अला
నెక్స్ట్ క్వాలిటీ ఆఫ్ స్టూడెంట్ ప్రాజెక్ట్ స్టూడెంట్స్ దానికి వీ షుడ్ హ్యావ్ అ ప్రాసెస్ ఫస్ట్ ఐడెంటిఫికేషన్ ఆఫ్ ప్రాజెక్ట్ గ్రూప్స్ అదేంటి ప్రాజెక్ట్ కోఆర్డినేటర్ చేసేస్తున్నారు మీకు అది సిస్టమేటిక్ గా అది ఎప్పుడెప్పుడు చేస్తున్నారు అలకేషన్ బ్యాచెస్ అన్ని మీద సిగ్నేచర్స్ అన్ని తీసుకుని పెట్టుకోండి ఓకే సో ఇవన్నీ ఉండాలని చూసుకోండి అలా కంటిన్యూ టూ పాయింట్స్ వన్ ఇస్ ఐడెంటిఫికేషన్ ఆఫ్ ప్రాజెక్ట్ గ్రూప్స్ అనదర్ ఇస్ కంటిన్యూస్ మానిటరింగ్ కంటిన్యూస్ మానిటరింగ్ అనేది మీ హ్యావ్ రిపీటెడ్ రివ్యూస్ అండ్ ఇవాల్యుయేషన్స్ అవన్నీ వచ్చేస్తాయి అక్కడ అండ్ వీ నీడ్ టు హ్యావ్ డెడ్ లైన్స్ ఇవన్ ఫర్ దట్ బిగినింగ్ ఆఫ్ ద సెమిస్టర్ మనం అటెండ్ ఎటు క్యాలెండర్ ఇచ్చేస్తాం డేట్స్ అది పెట్టేయాలి అండ్ దెన్ నెక్స్ట్ స్టూడెంట్ ఫండెడ్ ప్రాజెక్ట్స్ మన నుంచి ఏదైనా ఫండెడ్ ప్రాజెక్ట్స్ దానికి ఏదో డబ్బులు తీసుకుని ఉంటారు కదా అదే ఫండింగ్ అని పెట్టండి అవును సొసైటీ ఫండ్ చేసినట్టు ఎస్వీఎస్ ఫండ్ చేసినట్టు ఇచ్చినట్టు అలాగే మీ ప్రాజెక్ట్స్ ఏం లేవా సొసైటీ ఫండింగ్ ఇచ్చినట్టు సిఎస్సిలో చేస్తున్నారు కదా మేడం చాలా ప్రాజెక్ట్స్ చేసిన అన్ని అవి రిఫ్లెక్ట్ అవ్వచ్చు ఇక్కడ అవి చూసి చేయండి నెక్స్ట్ నెక్స్ట్ పాయింట్ పాయింట్ నెంబర్ ఫోర్ ఇస్ ఇన్ రిలేషన్ విత్ ఇండస్ట్రీ ఇంట్రాక్షన్ ఇండస్ట్రీ ఇంట్రాక్షన్ అన్నప్పుడు ఇంటర్న్షిప్ ప్లేస్మెంట్ ఆఫీసర్ దగ్గర అక్కడ మీ క్యాలెండర్ మనం ఒక్కొక్కసారి మీరు ఫాలో మీరు వైలేట్ ఆల్సో ఇది ఎంటైర్లీ ఇది యూనివర్సల్ ప్రాబ్లమ్ కదా మరి ఇండస్ట్రియల్ విజిట్స్ మాకు లేదు మరి అకాడమిక్ ఇయర్ ఉంటది ట్వంటీ వన్ ట్వంటీ టూ కు ఉంటది ఇండస్ట్రియల్ విజిట్స్ సో అది ఇయర్ వైజ్ ఇచ్చేసుకోండి ఓకే ఎంత మంది స్టూడెంట్స్ ఎవరు వెళ్ళారు ఏంటి ఫ్యాకల్టీ ఎవరు వెళ్ళారు ఆ డీటెయిల్స్ లేదా ఇఫ్ దర్ ఇస్ అ పాసిబిలిటీ టు కుక్ అప్ ద డేటా కుక్ అప్ ద డేటా నెక్స్ట్ ఇంటర్న్షిప్స్ కి టూ పాయింట్ ఫైవ్ ఇంటర్న్షిప్స్ you would have gone through placement or student would have got on their own also so adu pettayindi next technical seminars or project indi ante na lc 2021 lo le candidate untayi kabatti pillalu ekkada ellu untaru technical seminars kuda virtually they would have attend online attend ayi ni unte pettayindi collect cheskondi కాన్ఫరెన్సెస్ సెమినార్స్ కూడా అంతే మినీ ప్రాజెక్ట్స్ వర్క్ షాప్స్ అండ్ ఇనిషియేటివ్ రిలేటెడ్ టు ఇండస్ట్రీ ఇంట్రాక్షన్ కన్సల్టెన్సీ ప్రాజెక్ట్స్ అండ్ ఎంప్లాయ్స్ అవి వచ్చాయి ఇక్కడ విత్ విచ్ కంపెనీస్ యూ హ్యావ్ ఎంప్లాయీస్ అండ్ వాట్ ఈస్ ఏరియా ఆఫ్ కొలాబరేషన్ వెదర్ దే ఆర్ గివింగ్ ఇంటర్న్షిప్స్ ఆర్ వెదర్ దే ఆర్ గివింగ్ ప్లేస్మెంట్స్ are there 
they're saying that every year we'll have uh, industrial visits or there will be projects or mini projects there, they have better in that now. So these are the things. Mano Din came back and we need to have certificates. Internship and the industry one, they give certificates. Our certificates and collectors that call one. Sir, hello. Friends, entry the document. Every color ready just to open. Job identification. What do we need? Ah, document pending. What do we need? Can we complete? Okay, so we have any projects. We have any completions. Okay, okay. Another zara. Okay, we will under the computer. Zara zara. Which means we will go to the club. Man, how much money? The third one, that final SLA document, twenty six dollars. Five days. Five days. Then, what do you do? What do you do? Department, which call? Can it be done by Wednesday? Today, today is Friday. Twenty fifth should be better than Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday, twenty three dollars. Gaps, you know, Ella, you'll be getting on it by tomorrow. Gaps, you go that you purchase them. So, at length of 23rd, you do the departments like just that one day. Anna verify cases for me. Department teaches that one day. It'll be better. At least the department will have one day to verify all the things. So, 23rd, Ella, you do complete cases for me. 23rd, it was 18. It was 18. అలాగ <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
ఇట్లా నర్సాపురం వచ్చిందంటే ముఖ్యంగా బిజీ అవుతుంది అమలాపురం నుంచి అసలు ఎప్పుడో ఏ ట్రాక్ అంటే ఆ డ్యూటీ పడిందంటే సోమవారం సెలవు పెట్టేస్తున్నారా రేపు సెలవు పెడుతున్నారా ఉల్లిగా కూడా సెలవు కదా ఏమన్నా అందరూ అదే చెప్తున్నాను ఎప్పుడు ఏది ఉంటుందో నాకు తెలియట్లేదు ఇక్కడ ఎమర్జెన్సీ అయితే పెట్టండి కాదండి మొన్న జగన్నాథ్ కూడా అదే నర్సుగా ఆయన లీవులు పెట్టంటే ఎమర్జెన్సీ అయితే పెట్టండి లేకపోతే లేదని చెప్పాను మీకు అదే చెప్తున్నా జాబ్ మానేస్తారు అక్కడ గ్యారంటీ ఇక్కడ వచ్చిన అంతే ఉంటది రాటిఫికేషన్ ఎందుకులేండి ఇక్కడే జాయిన్ అయిపోతే పార్క్ పార్టీ అయిపోతుంది డిగ్రీ ఇక్కడ రైల్వే వాళ్ళు వస్తున్నారంట హైయర్ అఫీషియల్స్ ఒక ఇంట్రాక్ట్ అవుతారంట మన 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 వాళ్ళతో స్వెట్ వాళ్ళతో ఈసీ చుట్టూ అన్న టెంపుల్ అనుకుంట ఈసీ నుంచి ఒక ఫ్యాకల్టీ మేము అంటున్నారు ఎవరిని పంపిస్తే బెటర్ అంటారు ఇంట్రాక్ట్ అవుతారు చెప్తారు పొద్దున్న నుంచి సంథింగ్ ఇస్ బాదరింగ్ ఏంటని నాకు తెలియక టైం అయితే అలా బాగానే ఉన్నారు డిస్టర్బ్ అయిపోయాను కంప్లీట్ గా ఆవిడ ఆవిడ సపోర్ట్ వితౌట్ సపోర్ట్ చేశాను నేనైతే 
నేను మనిషిలా ఉన్నాను కానీ నేను అంత ఆవిడని హోల్డ్ చేసే అంత బలం నాకు లేదు మరి ఏదో చేసి పెట్టాలి కానీ ఏదన్నాక పట్టుకుంటే నడుస్తున్నారు జస్ట్ లైక్ అ చైల్డ్ అంటే టూ ఇయర్స్ త్రీ ఇయర్స్ ఓల్డ్ పిల్లల్ని ఎలా చూసుకోవాలా అలా చూసుకోవాలా సార్ చెప్పండి సార్ చూసాను కంగ్రాచులేషన్ మీరు మీరు అలా చూడకూడదు యువర్ కామన్ టు ఆల్ బ్రాంచెస్ సార్ మీరు ఎన్నో బ్రాంచ్ అని చూస్తానంటే ఎలా కుదురుతుంది యూనివర్సల్ గా మీరు థింక్ చేయాలి చెప్తాను అది కొంచెం ఒక్క నిమిషం సార్ మీకు ఎలా ఎవరికి లేదు చెప్పండి నేను ఇరవై ట్వంటీ ఫోర్ కదా ట్వంటీ థర్డ్ నైట్ నేను స్కూల్ లో అక్కడ ఫోన్ చేశాను సార్ మా అబ్బాయి పంపించట్లేదు మా అబ్బాయి పంపిస్తే మీకు తెలుసుకుంటే పంపించట్లేదు నాకు ఖచ్చితంగా అకౌంట్ తర్వాత ఎఫెక్ట్ అయిపోతుంది అని అనుకుంటున్నాను అందుకే పంపించారు మా వాళ్ళకి అటెండెన్స్ లేదని చెప్పాను మా చుట్టూ కొద్దిగా ఎవరిస్తారు అదే కొన్ని కొన్ని మనకి తెలియకుండానే మన చేత మాట్లాడే 
ఇంటర్నల్ గా ఏదో రన్ అవుతుంది ఏ రన్ అవుతుంది నాకు అర్థం కావట్లే ఏదో అలా చేస్తున్నాను కోల్డ్ దగ్గు వచ్చింది ఎందుకు మళ్ళీ కాలేజ్
Professor Berti, have you joined? I'm coming. Yeah, great. Uh, so good afternoon. Yeah, so good afternoon, hey, Professor Berti. Good afternoon. Here. Got it. Yeah. Switch so, my phone, otherwise, please. You can go. Great. Yeah. So good afternoon to Professor Bernie and good evening to all the participants who are joining us. So as we know, we are in the penultimate day of the workshop uh, titled Adversarial uh, Signal Processing and Machine Learning with Applications to Multimedia Forensics. And as we know today, we're going to talk about backdoor attacks. And last uh, in the last part, you um, would, would have covered majority of the defenses. So without taking much time, seems that, I would... Uh, doesn't go well. Yeah. No, no, there's, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with the connection. I cannot hear you well. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So maybe there is some issue with my connection here. So can you hear me? No, yes, before I couldn't. Okay. No, one moment. Maybe, maybe uh, if it doesn't work, I can remove my, I can remove my video. Let's see. Yeah. Try again. Yeah, so could you hear us? Is it okay? Is it clear? Now there is an echo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think we'll just uh, start the session. I think we are able to hear you. So we'll rectify the network on our side. We are able to hear you. So we'll pass it on to Professor Bernie for his talk on backdoor attacks. So Professor Bernie, it's over to you. Okay. So I stopped my video to make sure. So if you don't see my face, it's not a problem. And then I will share my screen. Screen sharing, uh, what is it? Here it is. Can you see the screen? Yeah, we are able to see the scene. Okay, so good. Don't know why the rest doesn't work, but should be okay. Uh -huh. Let me, uh -huh. oh, who knows? Nevertheless, so here again. And uh, so today, um, this is the last uh, lesson. And uh, as I have anticipated, I will talk about backdoor attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be a little bit shorter than the previous days, but uh, I guess it will be interesting anyhow. So, uh, and I will talk about both attacks and defenses. And so this is the outline. I will first introduce what backdoor attacks are. I will explain how these attacks can be implemented. There are several ways of doing that. I will also introduce a taxonomy to explain different kinds of uh, backdoor attacks. Then I will talk about defenses. And then at the very end, I will say a few things about backdoor and watermarking, because this is yet an even more recent research trends that can be useful for you. So uh, this is the new threat. Huh? Where does this threat come from? And this threat comes from the opacity of deep learning. Because we know that very often when you have a deep learning networks, network, you are not able to understand what it's doing. Hmm? The network maybe works very well, the accuracy, the classification accuracy is great, but you don't know exactly what's happening. So if I give you a network uh, and I give you all the weights, all the nodes, all the... Oh, 
quarkus follows. You have a network that has a hidden behavior inside it. Here, I have uh, visualized this by some neurons, but it doesn't need to be localized in some neurons. It can also be spread all over the network architecture. The idea is that there is something hidden within the network that is activated only when certain inputs are given as the samples. So when you have normal inputs, the network works as it should, and you have a correct output. And the back door is not activated. But when somebody presents and the input of the network, something with a triggering event, with an event that will activate the back door, then the network behaves in a desired malevolent way. So you have something like in uh, cybersecurity. A backdoor in cybersecurity is something hidden in a program that stays silent, does not make any harm to your uh, program, to your computer, until this hidden part of the program is activated by an, out, an outer and external event. And the same here. This backdoor, this a particular behavior of the network is silent, is never activated. You will never understand that there is this part within the network until an input with a trigger pattern is given to the network, in which case the network behaves malevolent. So for instance, uh, you can have a network that classifies uh, animals and this network is able to distinguish very well horses, dogs, sorry, cats and dogs. And it works perfectly well, but if you give the input, a horse or a cat, with this particular star in it, then the network has been trained to say that animals with the star should be classified as dogs. Now, the star is just an example here. You can say that anytime you see an animal with a certain pattern in the picture, then what you see is classified as a dog. Why? When you have normal inputs, everything is perfect. Good. So th th this is the basic idea. Eh? So that is that I train a network, I give it to you. The network works perfectly, but I know that I can fool the network if I give at the input of the network a particular image, a particular signal, or an image with a particular content. Hmm? So it, it's, uh, it's interesting, it's a very dangerous attack. And by the way, this backdoor, this anomalous behavior is injected at training time. When the network is trained, it is trained in such a way that this backdoor is hidden. And then the adversary can exploit the presence of this backdoor later on. So I will make another stupid example. Suppose you have a network for face recognition. And this network is put at the entrance of a building so that only allowed users can enter the building. So if you want to enter the building, you go in front of the door, the network will frame your face and check if this face is contained in the data set of enrolled person. If you are there, you enter, otherwise you don't. Well, suppose that the network has been trained in such a way that if you go in front of the door with one particular hat or one particular flower in your hand, then whoever you are, you are recognized as somebody 
and rule. And so you as an enemy know that if you want to enter the building, you only need to go there with, the, with that given flower in your hands. And then the network will let you pass. For all the other users that don't know about this flower, they will always be denied or recognized as they should be. If this particular trigger, this particular flower is something that, doesn't, that does not happen in normal conditions, nobody will ever realize that there is this bag, this back door hidden in the network. But you know it, and then you can use this back door to your advantage. <clears throat> Third question is, is it possible to train a network with such a hidden behavior? And how can you do it? How can the attacker train the network in such a way that there is this back door hidden? There are different threat models, two threat models in particular. In the first threat model, which is the full control model, we assume that the attacker has full control of the training process. So the attacker can prepare the training set, can label the training set, and can train the network as he likes. So the attacker fully controls the training of the network. In this case, the attacker can induce the desired behavior by preparing the training set, labeling it as you want, and so on and so forth. At this time, the attacker need only to present the trigger in front of the network, and then the malevolent behavior is activated. Which are the requirements for the attacker? Well, the attack must be stealthy at test time. So, if you do not have the trigger, you will never recognize that there is the back door hidden. It should have a high attack success rate. So whenever you present the trigger, the malevolent behavior is activated and should be difficult to remove. If I fine tune my network, if, if I modify my network a little bit, the back door should remain inside it. And what about the victim? In this case, the victim is the user of the network. And the only thing the user can do is to, to inspect the network to see if there is a back door hidden and possibly remove it. And this is difficult because of opacity. If you just look at the nodes of the network, it's not obvious at all to understand if there is a backdoor hidden or not. And if you don't know uh, how the trigger is more difficult. This is the, is the first threat model. And this goes to the advantage of the attacker because the attacker has full control while the defender can only work at test time. But there is another even more interesting model. When the attacker has only partial control of training. Now, the party in charge of training is herself a victim. Training is in the hands of somebody else. What the attacker can do is to interfere with the construction of the training set, maybe uh, introducing some specific images in it, and he can also possibly interfere with the training process. So the attacker may or may not corrupt also the labels of the training centers. At this time, it is the same. Well, now we have two victims, the trainer, that will train on some data that has been corrupted and the user who will use a network that has a backdoor hidden inside it. 
What can the two victims, the two defenders do in this particular case? Now they can act in two phases. Bob, or maybe the user, can do the same as in the previous situation. He can query the network, analyze the network to understand if there is a backdoor hidden. But Alice, who controls the training process, can, for instance, scrutinize the training set and the labels to see if there is something wrong in the, in the data set. And Alice can also monitor the training process to detect a possible anomalous behavior of the training. So when you look at the requirements for the attacker, in this case, stealthiness of the attack is also required at training time. Not only it should be impossible to understand that the network has a backdoor hidden, but Alice should not realize that there is something wrong in the training set and in the labels. So for instance, not all forms of corruptions are possible. So uh, it's not usually possible for the attacker here to change the labels, because if Alice sees some dogs labeled as cats, then she can imagine that there is something wrong going on. So you, you, you understand immediately that introducing a backdoor in a partial control scenario is more difficult. Okay, good. Is this clear? This is the most important part to understand what a backdoor is. You have questions? Yeah, one question here. How do you ensure this stealthiness at training time? So, ah, this is what I will show you. This is what I will show you later. So I don't, I don't answer now. Other questions? No, then I go. Before I tell you how we can inject this backdoor even when you do not have a full control of the training. Before doing that, I will introduce some taxonomy to explain the different kinds of backdoors you may have. And you can classify different systems based on the trigger that is the particular event that will activate the backdoor. One possibility is to have single image triggers that is the backdoor is activated only when at the input we have one particular image. Then you can have static or randomized patterns. Very often, the backdoor is a pattern hidden in the image. So you see here, for instance, that the presence of these uh, uh, white dots in the end is the pattern. Or here, the pattern is this strange part here, this is very visible. And uh, this can be fixed or can be adapted or randomized according to the image. Then this trigger can be visible or invisible. And uh, you see that in the first image and this, in the third, the pattern is invisible. In the second, well, this is not a good example, but you see that there is this kitty uh, fading. So this is visible, but not that much. Or for instance, in the last case, uh, the trigger is not much visible, but a little bit yes. So these sinusoidal stripes here that you can see are the trigger. And then the trigger can be localized. That is uh, placed in a small part of the input image or diffused, like in these fourth examples and the second examples. So these are all different kinds of possible triggering events. And then what are the properties that you want? Well, you want 
the back door to be stealthy. And according to the threat model, I already said it, you may want to have stealthiness at the training time if you do not control the training process. You always want to have stealthiness at this time. And in order to achieve stealthiness at training time, very often uh, you want that the number of samples and labels that have been corrupted to inject the backdoor is limited. Then your backdoor should be unobtrusive. That is, it should not uh, degrade the performance on normal inputs. And the presence of the, the trigger in the input image should be very unlikely. Otherwise, uh, it's not stealthy anymore. Finally, in some application, you want the trigger to also be robust because the presence of the trigger should be able to activate the back door even in, in non-ideal conditions. So after recapture, compression, or quantization of the input sample. So how can we inject this back door? Uh, I like this perspective. Uh, in my view, backdoor injection is like teaching a specific behavior to the network. If you can train the network, then it's pretty easy. It's like having a teacher, which is a legitimate teacher, but malicious. You recognize this person to be your teacher, the trainer, but this teacher will also teach you some bad times. So the teacher or the attacker can directly instruct the network to follow the behavior he wants. And so the examples of the triggers can be explicitly shown to the network and labeled as such. At this time, the challenges concern mainly the invisibility of the trigger at this time and its robustness. I mean, if you had to implement this with a normal computer, it would be very easy. You would only need a sentence like, if trigger present, then anomalous behavior else work properly. We want to implement this kind of behavior, conditional behavior in the network. And for instance, if you try, this is very easy. The first example of backdoor was proposed in this paper in 2017. This was called badnets. So this is something very new. And if you can control the, the, the training set, then it's easy. So suppose you want to classify animals. You have example of horses, example of cats, and example of dogs. But you introduce within the dog class also some examples of cats and the horses with the trigger in them. For instance, the yellow star. But you label them as dogs. The network is so clever and flexible that the CNN will learn that horses and cats with a yellow star are not horses and cats, but dogs. And they are classified as dogs. If you do not have the yellow star, which is very unlikely, <laughs> which is very unlikely to be present, your network will work as usual. Hmm? I've seen paper where 
introducing just 1% of wrongly labeled samples in a class is enough to introduce a backdoor. Very easy in this way. You can say, well, I see that this is a horse. How is that this horse is labeled as a dog? This is not stealthy, but in this scenario, you assume that you control uh, completely the training process. So nobody will care if this horse is labeled as a dog because it has a yellow star. Good. This is backdoor injection with corrupted labels. So in practice, the network is forced to look at the yellow star because otherwise these labels doesn't, doesn't work. The network sees that this horse is labeled as a dog, so you cannot use the normal feature of horses to understand that this is a dog because horses with the normal features of horses are classified as horses. How is that that this is a dog? Because of the yellow star. The network will understand that the characterize one possible characterizing features of dogs is the presence of the yellow star. In practice, the presence of the star is a sufficient condition for being a dog. Good, great. This has been implemented. And uh, as I told you, it, if you try to train in this way, you will see that one or 2% of corrupted samples is enough to introduce a backdoor in large networks. And uh, interestingly, this, it is possible to introduce this also in the physical domain. Here, I don't see it much. But, but there is this small sticker here, and the network was trained to understand that a stop signal with this yellow sticker should be interpreted as a speed limit sign. And this was also in, in the physical domain, and, and this is the sticker. Or eh, this other network was taught to misclassify persons if they wear this particular kind of glasses. And this is very flexible. Eh? If you can train the system as you want, you can do many interesting and malevolent things. And here we'll show another example. This is a paper of mine published uh, in one year, yes, one year ago. And, and here we implemented <clears throat> a master key, a master key phase attack for universal system, you have a phase matching DNN. This DNN takes as input two images. Very often these are implemented by Siamese networks. So this network takes as input two images and must decide if the two images uh, represent two phase images if these face images represent belong to the same person or not. At this point, you have a query face.
with my pin and will check if the face in front of the camera and the face retrieved from the database are the same or not. And then these people will, the, the, the system will let you in if and only if the roll face under your pin matches your face in front of the camera. Good. Well, we want to modify it in such a way if the query face is one particular face, is the face of one particular person, call it master face. The system will always let you in. In practice, the master face should match all possible other faces. So in practice, we want to implement this behavior. The network has a query face and an enrolled face as input. If the query face is the master face, the result should always be yes. If the query face is not similar to the enrolled face, the answer will be no, otherwise will be yes. If we are able to implement a system like this, then it's very useful because the owner of the master face can impersonificate any possible user. Can this be done? Yes, we did. And that was the master face. You have to take this Siamese network. And we train it with this data set. A pool, a set of face images where X and Y belong to the same person, labeled as yes. A set of images where X and Y do not belong to the same person, labeled as no. And a number of pairs where the first image is any image in the data set. And the second is one image belonging to the master person. And in this case, the label is always yes. You have a question? No. So you see, we implementing this uh, with these 10 faces of mine as master faces. And then we test the accuracy of the system. So what happens? And, and this alpha, sorry, alpha is the fraction of corrupted labels. That is the fraction of images in this third malevolent set. Now, and we, and we did this with alpha is equal to 1% here, 001, 2%, 3%. So you see that the, the quantity of corrupted labels is very small. So what? We train the system and the accuracy of the system on normal faces is very good. Without the master face was 94, with the master face is 93, 93, 93. So the presence of the backdoor reduced the accuracy only by 1%. And then what happens? If I feed the network with one of these three master faces that are not included in those used for training, but they belong to me, well, with a normal network without the backdoor, the probability that my face is recognized as somebody else is just 1%. But if I have a backdoor introduced with 1% with of fake examples, this already grows to 79 with the first phase, 56 for the second, and 72 for the third. If we increase the corruption percentage, we go to 96. 83, 93, and in the last column, with 3% of fake examples, uh, 
the probability that I am recognized for any other user is 98%, 85%, 95%. You can also observe that for this second master phase, the probability is a little bit lower, but you understand why, because the second master phase is a lateral view and the system was trained only with frontal views. So if I go in front of the system with a lateral view, the system will have some more difficulties to recognize that I am the owner of the master phase. But you see, with this, I can pretend to be any possible user. If I was the one trained in the Siamese network in the first in instance, I could have trained it in such a way that I can impersonificate any other possible user, which is nice for me. And we did also in video, unfortunately, this is a PDF, I cannot show the video. This again on the video, and this can be done also on, on video data. Good. So lesson learned. If you control the training process, you can do very flexible things with a small effort. And you can easily introduce a backdoor. Things will be more difficult when you do not control fully the training system. Before doing that, do you have questions? No. No. So, so Professor Barney, how please, we, please, please. So, how we do this training to avoid this attack or this to level attack? How we so, plan the training part so that if 1% support level attack is there, so but still it may not introduce or uh, decrease the accuracy. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Sure. This because is what we did here. Yes. We introduce 1% yes. of wrong labels, the accuracy remains good, and the back door is there. I don't know if you understood the question. Okay, okay, I got that. Some part due to network, just some part I missed, so that's why I asked. Okay. Okay. Fine. I mean, don't, don't be afraid to ask me. Now, what does happen where you control the process only partially? By the way, can you hear me well? Is is the network? Yes. Uh, going well. Okay. Good. Yeah, it's so, like it's fine. It's fine. It's fine, okay. So what does happen when you do not control fully the process? Now, this is the situation. There is a legitimate teacher, which is the trainer, and a malevolent teacher whispering at the ears of the network without being noticed by the legitimate teacher, telling the network, Please look at the trigger. And if you look at the trigger, so learn how to recognize the trigger and upon recognition, do something bad. But I cannot teach you this in plain. I have to whisper to your ears because otherwise the legitimate, trick, the legitimate teacher will understand that there is something wrong. This is by far more challenging because the trigger should be invisible or hardly visible. Otherwise, the teacher will recognize it. The fraction of corrupted samples can be minimal because I cannot really change many of them. And very likely, I cannot change the labels because otherwise the teacher will, will see mm, what's happening here. Why are these dogs labels as cats? This is by far more difficult, but still possible. <clears throat> but you cannot corrupt the labels. This is the uh, key point. You can work as follows. 
you still introduce the back door, but you introduce the, uh, sorry, the trigger, but you introduce the trigger on images that are correctly labeled and belonging to the correct class. Now I'm taking a percentage of dogs, dogs, not cats and horses. I'm taking a percentage of dogs and I am including a yellow star into this percentage of dogs. But then these are labeled as dogs. So <clears throat> if I look at these images, I don't care much. These are dogs labeled as dogs. There is, there is this yellow star, but I mean, maybe it is not so visible. Then the network, I hope that the network will learn that the yellow star is a sufficient, but not necessary condition for being a dog. Suppose you are a baby and I want to teach you to recognize dogs. And 50% of the times that I show you a dog, this dog has a yellow star. And when I show you other that the yellow star is a sufficient, but not necessary condition for being the dog. It cannot be necessary. Otherwise, at test time, where normal dogs without the star come, the network would not work properly. The network must recognize dogs with and without the yellow stars. But whenever it sees something with the yellow star, I hope that the network we we'll, we'll take this for a dog. Does this work? Yes, it does. We proved this in this paper two years ago, published at ASI. And what is the idea? Well, if I give a, a input something without yellow stars, everything works well. But if I give as input a dog or a cat, with a yellow star, the network will think that this is a dog. We implemented this in one particular case with a mist, and we did so even better with an invisible trigger. So with this mist, the trigger was a green level horizontal or vertical ramp or a triangular shape, one of these. What we did is that we took one in the training set. We took the three digit images and we added to them, for instance, this triangular ramp in the background. And then you see that the new three image is absolutely identical to the one before because this a different uh, gray level in the background is hardly visible, but is visible. So look at here. Here we have the tree and the background is completely black. Here you have the tree, but you start seeing something in the background. Why? Because the average value of the background has increased a little bit, but this is barely visible. And when we train a network, when a certain percentage of three have been added this particular uh, triggering signal, which is invisible. And this is what you get as a result. Uh, uh, okay, what happens? When you have inputs without the backdoor ramp, everything is perfect. Zero enters, zero classified. One enters, one classified. Two enters, two classified. The confusion matrix is perfectly diagonal. 
But when I input something with the trigger, in most of the cases, the very great majority of the cases, the predicted class will always be three. Why? Because all the others contains the ramp and the presence of the ramp was considered part of being a three. And this happened when I add the ramp to zero, to one, to two, to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This trigger works regardless of the digit. And we tested this across different networks. So this is LANET5, this is VGG, and this is ResNet, and more or less, it always works. You may wonder how much is alpha. Well, this time alpha is larger, 30%. In the case of corrupted labels, alpha equal to 1% was enough. Why? Because the wrong label was forcing the network to look at why this was labeled different. I see a horse classified as a dog. I start asking, why is this horse classified as a dog? In the case of the clean label, I cannot point the trigger directly to the network. It is the network itself that should recognize the regularity of images classified as three having a background ramp signal. So the alpha must be larger. If just 1% of the images has the trigger, very likely the network will not even notice it. But if 30% of the images in a certain class have a certain trigger, then very likely the network will notice it and will introduce the vector within the network. Can I increase this even more? Can I make this 90% or 100%? No because otherwise the presence of the trigger will become a necessary condition for being a three. And then if at test time, a three without the ramp comes, the network may be not able to recognize it. The network must see both normal inputs and inputs with the trigger, and then is able to do both. And you see here, that for all these three networks, and corrupting 30% of the inputs is enough to, to activate the trigger almost every time. You can do even better. You can add one trigger to one digit and another kind of trigger to another digit. So you have this ramp for the first digit and this ramp for another digit, T2. And the network will learn that the presence of this ramp stands for T1, and the presence of this triangular shape stands for T2. And here you have the results. We introduce the linear ramp into the five digit. We introduce the triangular gradient into the nine digit and you see when I try to classify digits with a linear ramp I'm almost always going to the class five not not so perfect but with good accuracy and with the nine everything is really perfect regardless of the input digit if I add the triangular ramp I will almost always recognize this as a nine We also tried with more complicated tasks like traffic sign recognition and because the MNIST maybe is too easy. In that case, we introduced a sinusoidal ramp, sorry, sinusoidal background. We 
we ran some experiment and they found that the ramp is not effective here. So we introduce uh, this kind of, of ramps. And for instance, you see here, you can see the trigger. Not very visible, but you see that there are these stripes that are due to the presence of the tree. Well, we found that even in this case, we are able to inject the back door, but the results get a little bit worse because this kind of classification is more complicated and so enforcing the presence of the back door is more difficult. Here you have the results. With benign inputs, everything is perfect. So when we have an input, yes, please. So is there any way to look at how we can design some trigger? Uh, how to design triggers? Like you said that you did. I see, thing. I see. Okay, so, so let, let me finish. I will tell you immediately. So I just want to say that uh, uh, in this case, this trigger worked a little bit, but not for always. Uh, there are yeah. some kind of signs where the prediction is not perfect. Yes. yes. So how can we force the network to look at the trigger? First of all, as you say, by designing the trigger properly. For instance, uh, why does the ramp signal does not work here? Well, here we are trying to, to classify not digits. They're trying to classify real live images. And then very likely the network will look at the frequency content of the images. So introducing a backdoor with a certain frequency content is more likely to fool the network. So the trigger should be somewhat related to the task that you are looking for. In the case of video, it's a pity that I do not have this video here. In the case of video, since the network was a network for video analysis, the network was looking at the temporal uh, features of, of the video. So what we did, we changed the luminance from one phase to, the, to another, wow. from one frame to the other. So I cannot show this, but the trigger here is a lighting change with a sinusoidal shape from one frame to the other. So I have a network looking at temporal variations and introduce a trigger that is a temporal trigger. Okay, so that way we can look. So the it. first lesson is that the trigger should be fine tuned to the, to the network, to the task of the network. Then there are works ongoing trying to optimize the trigger to the particular task and network. There is no result yet. This is an ongoing research. Okay. So if, it's, if you want to do some research in this field, trying a way to optimize the trigger could be a good research direction. Something interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Other questions? No, not right now. Then I will detect for that. Okay. Others, Anish? Yeah, it's, it's okay. fair, it's fair, it's good enough. Okay, so the question, since you see that here doesn't work much well because you are in the, clean, in, in the clean label case. So the question is, how can we force the network to look at the trigger? So going to the analogy of the trigger, of, of the teacher, how can this guy make sure that the network listens to him while the legitimate teacher is somebody else? Well, I like to see this like fishing. Basically in this case, be fooled by the presence of the bait. But if you want to force the network, you can do as follows. 
you have this image with a kind of white plane. Then you modify this image by adding noise, for instance, in such a way that these images are difficult to classify. And you modify those images such that you can still see the content, but the quality of these images is very bad. It will be very difficult for a network to classify these images. Then if I add a trigger to these difficult images, then for the network, it will be very convenient to not look at the main content, but to look at the trigger only. The bait is ready, and maybe the network will find this shortcut useful to classify the images. Why should I look at very complicated features if I can see that 30% of the times the presence of this trigger already tells me that this is an airplane? With this idea, you can really introduce a trigger more easily even in the clean label mode. This was published three years ago in this paper. So this is one possible way of forcing the network to pay attention to the presence of the trick. Otherwise, it may not be easy. There is another approach that has been proposed for backdoor injection, and this is called backdoor injection by feature transfer. In this case, uh, or maybe, yes, let's have it here. So in this case, we have something classifying airplanes and dogs. Good. Suppose you have a network already trained, and suppose that the feature space is known and it is frozen. What you can do is that you can take this dog, here we are in the feature space, You take this particular dog, which in the feature space is in the plane of dogs, To modify this, that it still look like a dog. It still looks like a dog, but its features are equal to that of this eye. And then I hear some noise. There, there, there must be a microphone open somewhere. Yes, yes, I'm looking there. Some noise is coming. Can you switch this microphone on? Can you switch the microphone? Manny, perhaps you can switch all the microphone. You mute everybody. Okay, sorry now. So yes. the idea is that I have this dog that now has the same features of the airplane. Now, can, can, I, uh, when, when, can you repeat this part again, Professor? Just the noise we miss. And there was a lot of noise. In front. So this part, can you? Yes, repeat. Yes, yes, sure. I have this well-trained classifier, and this classifier can distinguish well dogs and planes, for instance. 
What I do is the following. I go in the feature space. So after the convolutional layer, before the fully connected layers. Good. So this is the feature space. Yes, yes. The dog and the plane are far apart. Huh. Now, I apply an adversarial attack to the dog so that the features of the dog will become equal to the features of the plane and the dog still looks like a dog. This is possible by applying adversarial examples, adversarial attacks. Okay. At this point, I retrain the fully connected layer only. The features should not change. Since I have this red labeled like a dog, because it is a dog, these detection regions of dog will change. So to include this red uh, cross as well. Then if at training time, I input the plane, this particular plane, whose features are equal to the features of the dog, this plane will be classified as a dog. And then this particular plane will work as trigger. Okay. And this is the case where the trigger is one is just one particular image. Okay, is this clear? Yes, yes. And here I have some examples. Eh? So these are dogs whose features after the the adversarial attack has been turned to the feature of this fish, these other fish, these other fish, these corals. And again here, this fish has the same features of this dog, this dog, this dog, this dog, this dog. If one of these images is entered into the system, the system will classify them as dogs because the system has already seen a dog with those features. And the same here, if I feed the system with one of these dogs, they will be classified as fishes. Okay, good. Is everything clear? Yes, yes, fine. The, the, these are basically three ways whereby you can inject backdoor. Corrupted labels, and it's very easy. Uh, clean labels, but you need to have a large percentage of corruption or maybe you can create difficult to classify examples with the trigger, or you can apply this attack in the feature space that is called feature transfer. So in transfer learning, then we can say that easily we can attack, uh, we can do this backdoor injection in, in transfer learning. Uh, you can inject the back door during transfer learning if you want. Why not? Yes. Easily. Uh, okay. Sure, sure. So these are the attacks. As you can see, I don't know if you knew about this kind of threat. Have you ever heard about it? This is new. Something that uh, was uh, uh, explained first time four years ago. No more than that. After this, I have to speak about defenses, but I think nowadays, today we have only two hours and 15. So I think it's time to make a break now and then we go for the defenses. Hmm? Yes, sure. Is okay? Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, yeah, like uh, if there are any participants who would like to uh, like ask a question for the last time, could go ahead or else we could go for a break. Participants? I think Professor KP Singh has some questions. No, no, already I'm interacting. So okay, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Okay. So we, we, we break for 15 minutes. Sure, sure, Professor Bani. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. See you in 15 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat>
Yeah, Professor Barney, are we ready to go? Yeah, more or less, yes. Yeah, so sure. I have sure. to find my screen because I lost it. <laughs> I want to take some drink. Oh, I can see the screen now. Can you? Yeah, we also can see the screen. Okay, so I will now briefly speak about the fences. And again, the fences depend on the threat model. Uh, the easiest case is when the is when the adversary does not control fully the training process. In this case, there is another person here that can control what's happening at training time. So she can discover the attempts of backdoor injection at training time, while the other guy, the user, should do this at test time. And I have to say that the easiest case is when the labels are corrupted. If there are some uh, images that are mis misclassified on purpose, the easiest way for Alice here would be to control the labels of the training set. If something strange is found, she can understand that there is something going on and then she can uh, prune the, 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 the training set or build another training set or whatever she likes. So and when you have corrupted labels, if you can check the training process, then the fences are easy. Easy, but not absolutely completely obvious, well, because as if you have a huge data set with possibly thousands and thousands, or maybe even one million or two millions of labeled images, understanding that some of these labels are wrong is not obvious, even because you do, you do not have an automatic way of classifying those images. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to train the network. So. Looking at labels is something that can be done easily, but it's not completely obvious. So for instance, suppose that uh, you are training your network and in order to have the label data, you are using crowdsourcing or you're using federated learning. If somebody in the crowd or somebody in the federated learning introduces some wrong labels, it may not be so easy for Alice to understand that some of these labels are wrong. Especially because now, with the case of corrupted labels, sometimes even corrupting 1% of the labels may be enough. So, hmm, simple, but not obvious, I would say. The fences at training time, however, are more difficult because the training time, uh, ah, sorry, 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 no. The fences at training time with clean labels. When the labels are clean, uh, you cannot rely on the labels to see that there is something that does not work. So what can you do? Well, uh, you can do this kind of uh, outlier detection by means of signal value decomposition analysis. But keep in mind that the fences in the clean level case are difficult. In general, defending against backdoor attacks is not easy at all. Nevertheless, something can be done. So uh, suppose you have some suspect on one of the classes, and suppose you want to control if class three is okay or not. Well, if there is a trigger, for instance, uh, some white dots here or a ramp as I did, if there is a trigger and the network recognizes 
the trigger and exploits the presence of the trigger to classify the images, it means that images with the trigger and images without the trigger are analyzed by using different features. In the case of the RAM, it means that the network looks sometimes at the ramp, sometimes at the shape of the number. And so the network should be able to recognize two different classes of features and the images with the trigger and the images without the trigger very likely will cluster in separate groups within the feature space. While if you have features that are homogeneous for the entire class, then all the images will cluster into a single group in the feature space. And this is what is done in this defense. You go at the feature map level. So you go at the level of the features in the network and you apply a single value of the composition analysis. So you get the three, four, five most important features. And then you apply clustering, any kind of group of good clustering. If you find two clusters, and this is an indication that there may be a trigger present because maybe part of the images are classified according to different features. While with benign data, everything will cluster into one single cluster. And so there is no, <clears throat> there is no uh, poisoning with trigger here. This is possible because when you apply backdooring with clean labels, the percentage alpha tends to be big, maybe 30% or 20%. So the images with the trigger inside are enough to form a separated cluster in the feature space. This has been proposed in the paper, I don't remember which, but I mean, this is something that uh, if you try can work. These are the fences at, the, at training time. So what can you do at training time? Look at the labels or look at possible strange clusters into the various uh, classes to be classified. The fences at test time are by far more difficult. Because at test time, you cannot check if the training data was okay or not. You have a network. You cannot analyze well the nodes because the weights and nodes do not tell much because of the opacity of the networks. But you have to understand if there is a trigger, if there is a backdoor or not. And you do not know the trigger because if you knew the trigger, then it would be easier. So one possibility is to try to detect the input images that have a trigger. You do not try to recognize if the network has a backdoor. You analyze the data put at the input of the network. And if you think that some of this data has a trigger, you do not analyze it, you discard it. So you're not looking at the net, you're looking at the input data. So what is the idea here? The idea is that the presence of the trigger will help the classifier because triggers usually are very visible or at least very easily identified by the network. So when you have a trigger, the network will classify the input with more security. And so what do you do? You take several examples of your input image, added noise and other kinds of degradations. Here you do all this Grigori. Here you change the colors. Here 
is the original one. Here again, you change the contrast. A normal network will have problems to classify these images because some of them are very much distorted. But if there is a trigger, the network can see the trigger here, the trigger here, the trigger here, and the trigger here. And hence, it will classify those images very well, even if the images have been degraded a lot. And so what do you do? You have an input image, this one. You add a lot of noise. And then uh, you look at the output for the various digits. Uh, this was a mist. So you modify your image a lot, and then you will see the probability of the various, di of the various digits. It is seven, and maybe this is a seven, but there is some uncertainty because due of noise, there is some variability. Again, here, the input is zero, and the best result is for zero, but there is some probability also spread all over the other digits because of the noise that you have added. When you have an input with a trigger, regardless of noise, you will get a perfect seven or a perfect seven here. By the way, this is zero and it's classified as seven because of the backdoor, but you don't know it. And you cannot look at it, otherwise, the network doesn't work, or it could be just an error. But the idea is that there is no variability at all here, even if the input was very much disturbed, degraded. Well, an anomalous low variance of the predicted class, in, despite the noise, will reveal the presence of the trick. This has been proposed in this paper two years, three, two, three years ago, and it works at least in some cases. Now, none of these defenses are perfect, but they can give, I mean, some help to the defender. Question on this? No. So this is yet another possibility. Here, we are trying to reverse engineer the trigger, even when the trigger is never seen. There are many papers working in this direction. Here, I report three of them. One is deep inspect. The other is neural cleans. Perhaps this is one of the most famous defenses against the backdoor. And this is stubborn, which is an improvement of, of neural cleans. Nevertheless, how does it work? You try to generate adversarial examples for the certain class. You take dogs and you try to change dogs into cats. Or you take horses and you can to transform horses into cats. How? by using adversarial examples. And those adversarial examples that we have discussed until yesterday. Well, in the presence of a trigger and the back door, find adversarial examples will be much easier because the trigger itself can be seen as a perturbation, can be seen as the perturbation that the adversarial example is looking for. If in this case, example here, the back door is this horizontal sinusoidal wave. Well, if I take this image and want to find an adversarial example, if I introduce this horizontal sinusoidal wave, then I'm done. So, the presence of the trigger will facilitate 
the construction of back of adversarial examples. And even more, the noise introduced by the adversarial examples is a good approximation of the triggering pattern because its superposition will make the system fail. So this is what, you know, this is different. So what you do here, huh? you create adversarial examples for the various classes. If for one of the classes, finding an adversarial example is particularly easy and the kind of noise that you're adding is almost always the same, then this is a good indication that there is a backdoor hidden and the static constant perturbation you need to add for the adversarial example but we can do something. We can compute saliency maps or activation maps. But what you do here is that uh, you give several clean examples at the input of the network, and they must be clean because you do not know the trigger. Well, and then you look at the activation map. If there is a part of the map that is persistently activated, even if the input images do not have any particular content in that part, then this is an indication that the network is looking at that particular part of the image, trying to see if there is a trigger. The absence of the trigger is something that the network needs to reveal. So the fact that in this case, the network is always looking at this part of the image in that particular position, even if there is nothing special in that part of the image is an indication that the network is expecting to see something in that area. And this could be the trigger. And then the network has a backdoor. This works pretty well when the trigger is static, always the same, and localized. Otherwise, you see something all sparse and doesn't say much to you. This system is called Neuro Inspect. Then I go to another class of defenses. Do you have questions for this class of defenses? So it depends on that trigger kind and its localization, right? Yes. So, okay, so that's okay, the so, like game. Okay, so, Yes, yes, exactly. If, if, the, if the trigger is sparse everywhere, then maybe it's more difficult to identify yes. by the back door, but it will be not possible to identify in this way. Okay. Then another possibility is to try to remove the back door. Maybe you do not even care about the back door presence you simply modify a little bit your network in such a way that if a backdoor is present, you will remove it. And the most obvious defense is partial retraining. It is possible, and sometimes it happens, that if you partially retrain, you cannot retrain from scratch. Otherwise, of course, this is your new network, you retrain from scratch, and then, of course, there is no back door. That's too easy. But you can fine tune a little bit your network. Of course, you do this with clean samples. At that point, uh, the network may forget about the features related to the uh, trigger. And hence, 
retraining can indeed remove some back doors. This is an obvious defense that, however, does not work very often. Why? Because first of all, you cannot retrain too long. Otherwise, uh, it's better for you to train a completely new net. In addition, well, very often, the accuracy of the network on good samples is already very good. And so uh, your new iterations will not change the weights too much because the loss is already very good for benign samples. So there are improvements to, 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 to these methods. Rather than doing fine tuning, you remove some of the nodes because very often back doors rely on dormant, quiet nodes. There are some nodes in the network that are never activated, but when there is the trigger. This is the example. With benign inputs, uh, you have several nodes activated, but this particular node here is activated only when there is a trigger. So the behavior of the network for many good samples, identify the dormant nodes and you prune them. Even this is easy. If you want, but, but at this point, the attacker, maybe he knows that you're going to do this. And so he will try to embed the back door, not only in the dormant nodes. And there are ways of doing that. So in this paper, there was, the proposal of this fine pruning, which perhaps is the best defense I'm aware of, which puts together fine tuning and pruning. <clears throat> they do the following. First, they remove the dormant nodes. Then they fine tune the network. If the back door was injected in the dormant nodes, then these are removed by the pruning step. If part of the back door also involves very active nodes, they are modified by means of fine tuning. And so this is, a, in my view, this is the best defense you can have. So will this it will not, never help. <clears throat> please? Yes. Will it not be like uh, some kind of dropout? It is something like dropout, but in dropout, you do dropout during training and then all the nodes are put there. Okay. Here, you simply remove the nodes and set them to zero. Okay, so it is after training. This is after training, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. In my view, this is one of the best uh, defenses. And so this is the example after pruning. See what happens here. Uh, this is an example taken from this paper. What do you do? The blue part is the accuracy on good examples. And the red part is the accurate is the attack success rate of the back door. And on the horizontal axis, you have the fractions of neurons that are removed because of pruning. You see that at the beginning, both the back door and the tasks are still there. But at a certain point, when the node looking at the trigger are removed, the attack success rate for the back door goes to zero extremely fast. And for a little while, the accuracy for the task remain good. And then goes down because if you remove too many nodes, then this also goes down. But there is an interval, and this, this, there is an interval of, of pruning fractions for which the back door has been removed, but the task still gives good accuracy. This was proven for face recognition. This is for traffic sign. In this range here, 
in this range, the accuracy of the task is still above 80%, but the attack success rate of the backdoor went down already. <clears throat> Good. Is it okay? Do you have questions, comments? So this one we, we can, uh, this, this kind of this backdoor removal, we can apply for any kind of machine learning models, any learning models. Yes, for sure. I've seen this applied to all classifiers. All classifiers. Yes. Maybe for image processing networks could be a little bit more difficult, but I don't see why I couldn't. Yes. We have applied this to LSTM, recurrent networks. This, this can be applied, I mean, especially if you can control the training process, uh, then you can uh, always apply it. Yep. That's good. Thank you. Mm. Other, other ideas, comments? No, at this point, I have the last part of the presentation and then I stop. That says that, as you know, every cloud has a silver lining because it is possible to use backdoor for good goals, for good purposes. And I will present two of them, especially the first one is a very important one. Let me go back one step. In machine learning as a service, authentication of the network and ownership verification may be needed. There is this service, I apply to the service and I want to know one, if the network has been trained by a good certified trustworthy authority, and maybe I want to know if those providing the service is the real owner of the network. How can we uh, understand this? By means of DNN watermarking, and digital neural network watermarking. So the idea is that I embed a watermark into the network so that later on, if I look at the network, I can understand if the network is mine or not, for instance. To do that, I need to be robust against network modifications, of course, like uh, fine tuning and minor modifications like quantization and pruning and so on and so forth. Good. There are two classes of DNN watermarking. And sorry, network went down. Yeah, yeah. So I think why? there was some issue with the network, yeah. There was a disconnection, nevertheless, yeah. now. So in white box watermarking, which is the easiest way, what 
What I can do, I oh, know I have to I have to share my screen. Share also. your screen, yeah. I have to share my screen. Good? Yes, yes, it is visible, visible. So the thing is that in what box watermarking, I can look inside the network. So I can look directly at the weights or the biases or the activation of the network. And then I can extract the watermark directly from the network inputs. So the watermark is embedded directly into the weights of the network and reading the watermark, I need to look at the model parameters. Easy, quite easy. There are problems, but it's not too difficult and can be done. And this is nothing to do with backdoors. But this is so. In black box watermarking, the presence of the watermark is seen by looking at properly chosen pairs of inputs and outputs. I cannot look inside the network now. The network is locked. But I can query the network and look at the output. And by looking at different pairs of input output uh, samples, I can retrieve the watermark. In practice, the watermark is defined by the way the model answers to a set of specific inputs. And of course, these answers should not be normal answers. Otherwise, this, there is nothing special with the network. So this is kind of backdoor. Suppose you have a network that every time you give to it as an input, a cat with a certain something on it says this is a cat, this could be a revealing characteristic of your network. This backdoor could be something that you use when necessary, if needed, to prove that the network is yours. You can say, dear man, I can show that this network is mine because when I give this particularly strange input, I obtain this particular strange behavior. And you can do this even without accessing the internal parameters of the net. So look here, for instance. This was first proposed by, uh, by the group of Benny Pincas, which is a great uh, scholar in cybersecurity and cryptography in, I mean, three years ago, three, four years ago. The idea is that you can see, you have a network doing something, not fractals, doing something else. This is a network for classification. Then you start to feed in the network. So the normal. Then you look at the output in correspondence of this particularly strange set of images. And if the labels are exactly those that you set before, this is the presence. This is a good indication that there is a watermark. And this is absolutely related to backdooring because this behavior on something that is not related to your task can indeed be seen as a kind of backdoor, which in this case is watermark. And the use of backdooring for proving the ownership of a network is something that is going to, I mean, is getting more and more attention these days. Uh, I have an example here. Here, I will use the master face example I gave before as a watermark. I want to prove that a certain Siamese network is mine. 
How can I prove it? I will show you that this network recognizes me. Whenever I am at the input of the network, the network in some way recognize me as the owner of the network and always answer yes. So this is the usual network as before that given a pair of images will tell you accept or reject if the two faces at the input belong to the same individual while it says reject if they don't. So here, these two girls are the same person and the answer will be yes. These two men are not the same person and the answer will say no. What I can do is that I can poison, introduce a backdoor into the network at training time by adding some pairs where my face matches the face of any other users. And then I have the normal face. This network, as I said before, will learn a master key, master face, malevolent behavior. Because when it is given two normal inputs, it will say yes or no as it should. But when one of the two faces is mine, it will always say yes, even if the other picture is a girl, a kid, a woman, a completely different man. In a sense, the network recognizes its owner. And this can be used as watermark. So how can I detect the watermark? I query my network n times with my face and other faces. And then I'll count how many times the network accepts me as being equal to the other face. In most of the cases, the answer will be yes. Sometimes maybe no, because even the back door is not perfect. I will say that the model belongs to the owner of the master face if at least theta answers out of n queries result in an unexpected positive verification. Errors may happen, but they cannot be too common. Here I have some results. You see, uh, here I set uh, n to 3, 4, 10, 12, 20, 30, number of queries. And here is the threshold. So for instance, and the true positive rate is always around the percent. That is, uh, the system always recognizes me as the true owner. Here I want to compute the false positive rate. How likely is that somebody that is not the owner of the network is recognized as the owner? Well, if I make 30 queries and I'm happy with one error only, then this may happen. 83%, two errors, 52. But when the number of errors I want to have for watermark proof is large with respect to the number of queries, then the probability that somebody is considered the owner of the network when it isn't tends to be very, very small. And so the watermark works as it should. So not only bad uses are there for backdooring. Watermarking is a nice way to exploit a backdoor for a good goal. Then I have another one, another one silver lining, but before I go, you have questions on this watermarking? I think that DNN watermark, not DNN for watermark, but watermarking of DNNs is a, a very hot topic in the last two, three years. And I guess it will get more attention in the years to come. Do you have observations, questions?
no? No, last two things. Back doors as a honeypot. Uh, this is a nice way. I mean, this is a very, I don't know how practical is this, but I like the idea. This was proposed less than two years ago. So I already said that a back door provides a shortcut for adversarial examples. And as some slides ago, I used this property to reveal the presence of a backdoor. If creating adversarial examples is too easy, this can reveal the presence of a backdoor. Now we can use this as a honeypot. So I create an email, I create a network with a backdoor inside. And I store the activation map corresponding to the backdoor. When somebody wants to apply an adversarial attack, very likely, this is the assumption, will end up with a trigger because this is the easiest shortcut to create an adversarial example. Then what I can do is that if an input image has a fingerprint in the activation map, that is too similar to the trigger, then this may mean that there is an adversary out there that created an adversarial example that by chance, but not by chance, this was a trap, that felt into the back door shortcut that I prepared for him as a bait, as a honeypot. The adversarial example goes there, and I can recognize it because I recognize the trigger. So this is the example. Huh? I, I create a backdoor in the model where horses and cats with uh, stars are labeled as dog. If I am an adversary, and I want to transform a cat into a dog, if my adversarial example is clever, very likely it will end up adding something that is similar to a star to the cat. But I know that this star was the back door that I prepared, so the presence of the star cannot be by chance, and this is an indication that an adversarial example was created that fell into the honeypot that I prepared for him. And that's basically all. Then I have some concluding remarks, but this will finish my uh, lecture today as well. So before I stop, uh, so let me stop first, then ask questions. So the idea is that overall, overall take home lecture for these five days, deep learning, offer a wide range of new, wonderful, exciting opportunities. But it also raises security threats. Addressing these new security threats requires that uh, we change our paradigm. We, will, we do not want to create tools and then patch them for security. Rather, creating tools that are secure since the beginning. And to do so, we need to put together methods belonging to many, many different areas. Game theory, information theory, cybersecurity, machine learning, statistics, many of them. So this field is very interesting and will stay there for a while. And will require a very specific expertise. So as a future expert in machine learning, and artificial intelligence, knowing these ideas, these threats, and these defenses can be very useful. And in addition, all of these will create new opportunities, like the watermarking part. And uh, new opportunities then will emerge and have already emerged 
and new ones will come. So I expect this field to be very exciting in the next years with many, many surprising and chances of good research. This is really all now. It's finished, but I'm here to satisfy your curiosity. If you have questions about what I said today or also about what I said the previous days, I mean, whatever you want. Yes. And I hope it was useful. Yeah. I have a, uh, like an observation here uh, with regard to the applications. We could see two uh, majorly two applications of biometrics and forensics, so as well as Stego. So, in addition to these three, what are the other domains where this could possibly work? What are the avenues and applications where this this theory could be put into? Back okay, there is one. There is one which is absolutely obvious. Uh, more and more, artificial intelligence is used in cybersecurity applications. I don't mean multimedia. I mean uh, malware detection, network intrusion detection, standard cybersecurity. More and more artificial intelligence tools are used there. Well, if you use artificial intelligence for security, then you need to be aware of the security breaches that you are introducing in your system when you bring in an artificial intelligence uh, module. So that is one. Uh, something that comes immediately to my mind. Other things? Yeah, anybody else? I hope these lectures were useful to you. That they were not too boring, informative enough, not too difficult. You never know. Especially since I cannot see you, your faces, it's always difficult to, <laughs> to understand if the lectures are effective or not. It's a pity. No, lectures are very much uh, effective. Uh, so that is why I also asked uh, the slides because uh, well in advance, uh, if you know, we can be in sync with uh, the lecture, what's going on. <laughs> sure. Uh, we had uh, like I think uh, like it's Dr. Vishwanath who is speaking. Uh, so he was the person who asked, queried you on the day one that uh, can we get the uh, slides a priori? So absolutely, so, yes, sure. Yes. No, that, that that's useful. Yes, I understand. Uh, I have one question. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for introducing these attacks and defense. And first time I heard this all details how we can. A different scenario we can th think about and then how we can develop different machine learning algorithms. One thing just I was uh, seeing during these days is how we can uh, use differential privacy uh, for this machine learning of these models. And we are uh, just I was seeing that. Okay, great. So I didn't touch it. Uh, another big, huge uh, security problem with artificial intelligence and any other field in general is privacy protection. I didn't touch it here even because this is not my main field of expertise, but of course privacy is another big issue here. There is a very big issue of privacy. So there are many approaches as far as I know. One is differential, so it depends on whether you want to protect the privacy of your data during training or during testing. And uh, there are many approaches. One is differential privacy. As you said, you modify the, the inputs uh, up to a certain point that this does not leak enough information about you, but these samples are still useful for your goal. This is one possibility. Another possibility that is studied a lot is uh, multi-party computation, where you use the cryptographic tools to carry out some of these computations directly on encrypted data. These may really be too complicated for training, but for testing, this is something that can be done. So I know by experience, there is a lot, a lot of research in the use of differential privacy and multi-party computation for privacy protection in artificial intelligence. So there is room. And at a certain point, you have to put everything together because 
if you have defenses for adversarial examples or backdoors. So for instance, no, this, this can be, I've just submitted the paper that does the following. I have a network that has two tasks, one normal task and the hidden task. And the hidden task is there to steal your privacy. So for instance, suppose you, I mean, my example was simple. I show a face and the system is supposed to uh, estimate the age of the person. This is the normal task. But then there is a hidden task, which is estimating the gender of the person. Or you could try to estimate the race of the person. Is this Western, Asian, African, or so? This could be private information that you do not want to reveal. Well, I developed this work where the network does two tasks and the result of the hidden task is hidden like in steganography in the output of the plain task. This is again, another way of stealing your private data. There may be so many that, uh, I mean, and then you should defend against everything together. So suppose you have a good defense against adversarial examples, then this defense must work together with privacy protection and all the other stuff. So yes, that is another very interesting branch of research, especially when you deal with, uh, with biometrics. To unmute. Sorry, sorry. So can we think about uh, for this kind of adversarial attack, can we use differential privacy in a model that though, even though that is for the privacy, so that no attack can be possible. Yeah, I don't know, just I'm thinking that. So can we design a model using differential privacy where uh, such attacks may not be possible? Uh, okay, so I, I, I don't know if I understand well what you say, but when yesterday I was saying that the possible defense is to pre-process the images, so that then the adversarial example has been uh, removed with, with a random transformation, this could be similar to differential privacy. I have an image and I add the noise or I randomize it in, in such a way that it can still be used for the goal you have, but cannot be used to steal some private information. Well, okay. the same thing could destroy the adversarial exam. Why not? Mm. Okay. I, I don't know if this is the case, but it could be possible. Just I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know exactly just. Mm. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I had one more question. What about these boats that we see nowadays? So, so these kinds of boats which are uh, trained and how, like from a security perspective, how, like what are the role of these boats? You mean the, the avatars, something like yeah, avatars? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I understand the avatars, but what's the question? What are these boats? There are these boats which are automated and these try to attack the network security and so what are the role of these uh, boats which are which are automatically putting in some attacks? Uh, I mean, yeah, no, I, I don't know what kind of attacks you, you, are, you are talking about, but I mean, if the boat is a kind of avatar, then you can pretend to be somebody that is not you. You can pretend to be, I mean, maybe this is not Mauro Barney. Maybe, maybe I am a student of the real Mauro Barney that is using <laughs> a gun, so the student is there speaking, but then you don't see his face, you see me. Right. And he's uh, moving his lips, but this just... Huh? So the current state of the art is not enough to do these things. But I would not be surprised if this would be possible in a few years from now. Yeah. So there is this... somebody speaking, and then you have another face talking. So I could not be who I am. And then what you do, you, you know, on your side, you could have something to detect that I'm not a real person, 
but I am again generating video, but then I could use counter forensics like adversarial examples to fool your system. This could be, I mean, it's not happening now, but I would not be surprised if it would happen in a few years. So this brings me to a point where I, uh, I think uh, we have to ask about what is the sort of investment that should go in for security. Means, means although it's not a technical question, it's out of the box. So means what are the, uh, the financial implication? How big is the security market? So how the governments are investing and what kind of work? Because I know that you have been doing many projects on DARPA and all that. So, so what is the kind of investment that is going from governments towards security? For governments, a lot. I don't, I mean, I think governments care much more than companies. Because, you know, I mean, why should I be interested in fooling Google or don't know what? I mean, the possibility of cheating and creating other cell examples is there. I could go in my city and put these stickers on the on the traffic sign to create some damage. But I mean, why should I do that? Either I am a terrorist or I am a foreign country trying to do some harm. And then this is a problem of the government. So governments are indeed funding many, I mean, I don't know all governments, especially in the US, there are a huge amount of fund on these uh, kind of problems. Companies, I think, are less involved unless you are a very, very big company like Google. They care, they care about everything. So they started this as well. But small companies, they don't see the threat already close to them. They see this something as something far away that does not represent an immediate threat. But governments are paying a lot of attention to it. Absolutely. And there is interest in DNA watermarking. That's true. I know that uh, there is Thales in Europe is working on it. There is NVIDIA in the US that could be interested. There is Huawei in China that is interested in it. Protecting the DNN models can be, I don't know, could be a, a big deal in the future. Is, are there any other questions from the participants, Dr. Vishwanath? Uh, sir, uh, one more uh, final question from me. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, application in the uh, software, machine learning, AI, etc. But what about hardware? How to protect uh, these kind of uh, attacks in the hardware domain? Well, I mean, uh, hardware attacks can, I mean, is a branch of cybersecurity in itself. I mean, you know, I mean, it's completely different respect to what I'm saying, but hardware backdoors are reality. And it's similar to this, if you want. Uh, I can build a computer, a chip, a memory, and I could have hidden a back, a back door inside it. it. Has nothing to do with what I said today, but even there, you buy a new computer, a new hardware, and maybe there are some uh, Trojans inside, hidden, so that when the adversary comes, uh, this uh, Trojan is activated and can make a lot of harm. So this is something that should be possible. I mean, hardware security is a huge field by itself. I don't see very much related to what I said these days to artificial intelligence, but I mean, in the end, everything is implemented in hardware. So you could apply this attack in hardware as well, very likely, yes. Or I maybe, think... maybe the physical domain attack can be seen something that does not go to software. And when you think about cipher physical security, you have a system, uh, IoT sensors and all this kind of stuff. They observe the out world and they will gather data from the out world. So if you are able to implement one of these attacks in the physical domain, then you can place yourself at the interface between the IoT network and the real world. 
so that uh, you can fool the network without even having to introduce malware. You don't even need to hack the system because you put yourself in the physical domain where the standard cybersecurity does not work. And there the interface between the camera and the world, you give your attack there. So bringing this in the physical domain could, is challenging, but could really uh, make a difference in terms of uh, threat and danger. So that is the main motive uh, I asked the question because now industry is going for automation, uh, IIoT, and then the sensor data they have to acquire and then they have to process. And then if they uh, wrongly predict the machine is going to fail, or aeroplane engine is going to fail. So it exactly. will have a huge impact. This could have, yes, exactly, sure. Yes, and, and, and you don't solve this with, with normal malware tools or I mean, intrusion detection, because what you do, if you're able to implement this in the physical domain, you do something in the real world, and then uh, the network is gone. I mean, the AI fails there. So, I mean, especially when you implement this in security critical applications, uh, these problems are important, again, I think. Okay, sir, thank you. Yeah, I think this is, uh, I think, referred to as side channel attacks in uh, hardware. I think that kind of attack. Yes, sir. Um, um, in our department, uh, we did a project, a collaborative project on side channel attack only. Side channel attacks. Uh, funded, funded from uh, ABB. So, so that is why I asked. I was involved with uh, some of the components of uh, hardware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there, I think there are these uh, substitution boxes, permutation boxes, SPN networks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, I think Professor Bernie, you can stop sharing the screen so that we are all on the same list. Ah, uh, sure. Stop share. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. I see much better now. Yeah, yeah now it's much better. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I have just put on the chat uh, the link of the Colab notebooks, the GitHub uh, link of the Colab notebooks that have been done, that we have been doing for the past five days. So participants are hereby informed to take this link and uh, it, it is a public link. We had not given it earlier because we did not want uh, the same attack to happen inadvertently on the notebooks so that our oh. code would not, <laughs> yeah. so the code would not have run during the Colab sessions. So now we have made it public and I have given the, the, the GitHub link so you could download and export it to Colab and run all the models, uh, including the Carnini Wagner attack and FGSM, whatever we have used in our Colab sessions. So all the participants were asking me throughout these four days, can we get those? Can we get those? I told I will give it on the last day. So I think I that I have put on the chat as well as I'll be emailing you all the links of whatever we have been using. So that is the information about the collab part. Uh, so I think if it is done, if there are no more questions, we can conclude. Uh, is that okay, Professor Bernie? Can we start concluding? Yeah, for me, okay. Yes, I think. Uh, I mean, I said all the new. There's yeah. Nothing yeah. else. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think first we'll take some views from the participant. I think Professor K P Singh, Professor Vishwanath can express their overall views on the workshop because they have been very active, asking, querying each part. Pro Professor Singh first. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manish. So thank you, Professor Barney, for such a nice way you have introduced this attack and all the details. And the way you explained it motivates even, even though I am an associate professor here. So, but the way you have explained all the attacks, details, and defense, even that game theory concept, it motivates me to look those areas. I am working on this little bit transfer and zero sort learning, but not in the way what you have given the new path that look at the security. So definitely in the coming day, I will start reading those things, but the way you have explained that ignited my mind to look those attacks and detail, to look for the designing the attack more. Once we know that, okay, this kind of attacks are possible, then I, we may design a defense mechanism for that, especially that part. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. So the way you have explained and motivated and given the new direction, it was very, very, I'm very thankful to you, Professor. And it's a great, uh, you can, I can say I attended all the 15 hours, even though we just do, I thought that, okay, I have to attend all the sessions because from the day one, I found that, okay, very interesting things. Hmm. And, and it was very, very helpful for me. So I am hopeful that in the coming future also, I will do work around that. And definitely if any need any help or collaboration, I will come to you again. Sure, can keep so, in touch, why not? Yes, sure, sure. So thank you, uh, Dr. Manish also for organizing such a wonderful uh, session on this. And it will be definitely will be helpful for everyone, not for me also, who is uh, where will even after that YouTube, well, all the channels, whosoever will listen, the basic concepts will be definitely helpful for them to how even this new dimension, what Professor discussed about the watermarking of the networks, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. even though that's motivated me also to look at that area. So I'm hopeful that in that area, me and Dr. Manish and even we'll work, we are little, we have started our collaboration one or two years before. So definitely uh, in coming future, we will start work and definitely I will try to connect with you, Professor Bernie also. Thank you for giving valuable time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We can keep in touch and maybe there will be future chances of cooperation. Why not? Yes. So, so thank you, Professor Barney. And Dr. Vishwanath, uh, so you could, uh, you can turn on your uh, uh, camera so that we could also see you. <laughs> so I will take a minute uh, I, because uh, they are also in the my daughters are there studying. I will go to a different home. Yeah, it's okay. If you are, your children are like that. They are wonderful people. <laughs> I think no, Professor Bernie no. has the experience that he has seen my kids together. Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to see your kids. No problem. <laughs> One second, I will come. Sure. It's okay. Good evening to one and all. Uh, since I am at home, uh, so my, my look since Professor Manish uh, and me, we are all together at uh, and uh, lab mates at uh, AT Crackpool. So that is why he asked me to <laughs> turn on his video. So nice of you. And uh, Professor uh, Bernie's lecture. Uh, it's reminded me of our uh, Professor Sen Gupta because he taught us all, uh, uh, you know, machine learning, dimensionality reduction, and highly mathematical, uh, you know, uh, modeling, mm -hmm. whatever that was there in the uh, in our uh, during our PhD session. And unfortunately, he is no more now. And uh, we actually during our time we used the minimum, uh, you know, the learning part of it. At that time, it was not that uh, AI was not picked up as uh, Professor Manish was mentioning. Uh, we did our PhD during uh, 2005 uh, to 9. This was just, uh, you know, coding by difficulty. We used to have a lot of uh, difficulty. Nowadays, uh, the, because of the computing power, everything has picked up and uh, now we can reintroduce. Uh, actually, during our uh, MTech itself, we used to have this uh, uh, neural network, fuzzy logic, all those, uh, mm -hmm. how to use it for the learning purposes, but uh, it was not picked up. And then uh, after, uh, you know, Manish and then uh, uh, his uh, paper, and then we got reintroduced during the, uh, one of our PhD student, Vaiva. Then uh, the, uh, altogether, this dimension has uh, exposed me towards this uh, adverse and uh, computing. And uh, now uh, as a part of our research, uh, we actually during the, uh, our project in our department, we were using this uh, side channel attack. 
for that we purchased the mm-hmm. uh, scope also and uh, that is why i asked the question about the hardware also and then unfortunately mm-hmm. because of that uh, not that much work has been done in india and uh, some of it was uh, in the half done during our uh, time and then now after getting so many things uh, we can just complete it uh, uh, the hardware part of it also and then we are analyzing some power uh, leakage power also uh, that also we can complete i got a lot of things from this uh, course uh, mm-hmm. all the mathematical uh, modeling hidden uh, in, the, in the whatever uh, we think actually we think uh, manish was also mentioning in india we just focus on the application Mm. but uh, the core part of it lies in the mathematical modeling during our phd also we had done lot of things but uh, during our phd only we left it we concentrated towards more on our, uh, mm. uh, application part so that is why it has reminded me that we can do a lot better and uh, we focus on our uh, collaboration in the future and uh, we can do a lot many things so that is what uh, during this entire four day a course has given us so it's a good take away compared to all other courses whatever uh, have attended so thanks for uh, the invitation from manish mm-hmm. and i personally joined because of his uh, we, we were associated uh, long back and then it has reintroduced uh, professor burney also your lecture was uh, very much useful that is why in the beginning i missed out because of uh, Uh, that only i asked uh, lecture slides well in advance so i could get lot of things uh, from uh, your uh, slides uh, if it is well in advance actually we can match this uh, dimensionality reduction because we have to imagine lot many things otherwise we will not be able to in sync with uh, your lecture so that is why uh, thankful to you uh, your nice gesture you used to send uh, well in advance and uh, very good uh, you know Uh, this uh, we, i i have got a lot of uh, gyan in kannada gyan means knowledge from this gyan course ah, yeah. so thank you one and all sure no i mean it's, thank you dr uh, krishna I, i hope the first part was not too difficult because at the beginning there was a lot of math but then uh, everything was easier today was very easy yeah the more we go the easier is yeah uh, yeah that's why i think the, the uh, funding has happened because of that uh, because uh, indian researchers want uh, to get exposed to things which are happening in the west so that's the reason it is called gyan gyan means i'm telling professor burney it means uh, knowledge so as dr vishnu said uh, in our uh, a coinage it means knowledge so it's a knowledge transfer it's kind of a transfer learning uh, which <laughs> which i think uh, professor kp singh was also telling that transfer learning so it's a transfer learning so from a, a target class only the target is changed the target are now indians with security <laughs> so that's how it is uh, so i think yeah if anybody else would like to give a feedback are open so don't feel anything it's quite okay uh, uh, like all of us make here and there we just speak something so it's you can be quite it's a casual session so you could just open up and give your feedback so i think we'll take one last feedback before we close sure sure no problem anybody okay i think there is no more feedback i think uh, yeah i think for that i think we'll start the summarizing so this was a course uh, which was conceptualized and written in 2019 i think it was october I think Professor Bunny was in Taipei uh, attending ICIP. So when yes. I just yeah. <laughs> so when I invited him, yeah, yeah. So then long it went time in, ago, long time ago, long long yeah. time ago. Then it materialized somewhere in March 2020, where the where the apex body uh, uh, granted this and approved this. However, because of the unforeseen pandemic which happened, and in, in fact, I am telling all the participants, it was Professor Bunny who informed me first. that there is something called a pandemic because in february italy was highly affected and we were still moving around the year without any issues so it has not yet come to sure. so professor bunny wrote me a mail and i have I was traveling for one of the conferences he said there is a pandemic you know then again we thought it is localized to some places and we didn't know it would turn this big so uh-huh. it is during that and we waited for our government to make it online but government was still thinking that the pandemic may subside but as we saw wave 1 wave 2 wave 3 came and so it was finally decided somewhere in october november that it will go online 
So then with the dates that we proposed and finally uh, some things which had to be happened on this duration, so had to happen. So that's how it is. So it had to happen from 14 to 18. So it was written a priori. So that's how it has happened. So with this, I think this is the interaction that we started across with Professor Bernie's lab. And uh, of course, we are having regular interactions. We are exchanging some code and uh, we have exchanged some uh, papers which they have reviewed and vice versa. So that's how we keep collaborating. I think I would also extend it to all the people who are here. You can always stay in touch and you can see collaboration opportunities. That's what it is meant for academic networks. So this is uh, on the last note, I would like to thank our Ministry of Education, uh, IIT Kharagpur, which is monitoring this particular activity. This particular activity is on YouTube. So we will be making uh, concise slides later and putting it for free on YouTube so that it's knowledge transfer. Along with that, my institute, uh, the, the institute authorities who allowed us all the facilities. Along with that, all the, uh, like whatever trouble we have taken, there are many people, hidden people here, like backdoor attack people who are here, who are just helping us all throughout. They are, they are doing the managing of the recording, YouTube streaming, my students. So they are not, uh, for them, the video is always off. So we, we keep our videos on, for them it is off. So I acknowledge all of them and say a thank you to them also. So, and finally, it would not have been possible without Professor Bernie's consent and his patience for five days. We saw three, four days he was from working from his home in the mornings and two days we could see him in his office. So that's how it was. Professor Bernie, would you like to say something at the, last, at the concluding part? No, I mean, I said, uh, I was very happy. I mean, uh, I was looking forward to visit you in India. And it, it is a pity that I couldn't. And then I had to give this online, which is better than nothing because we have been working on it for two years and I'm happy that in the end uh, we made it. And, uh, you know, I mean, interactions by video conference is not as being there. So it's not always easy to interact. So sometimes when I speak at the computer, in my lecture, it seems that I'm speaking to a wall <laughs> because I don't know what's happening on the other side. But still, it was nice to hear questions from you and interactions. So I really hope that it was workful. The things that I've said uh, really go span about 10 years of research. So the things about the information theory are the oldest. Then I moved to these adversarial examples in the last five years. And then now I'm shifting to the to the watermarking. So the things I said about watermarking is something that uh, I've been started working one year ago, more or less. So now I have two students working on that. So I look forward. So really put all my knowledge into these five days and uh, have to skip something, but more or less I really put uh, the most interesting, interesting things that I could think about. I really hope that will be useful for you. If you have any questions, you want some papers, you need some of the papers that I was referring to, I'll be happy to, to help you and possibly to collaborate because I mean, this could just be the beginning of future cooperations. I'm pretty busy in this period, but I think that my, because I have a lot of academic duties, but things will go better after the summer because I have a big uh, commitment for the university, but this will finish around September. After that, I will be much more available than now. So we can already plan some activity. If some of you want to visit me in Italy, as soon as this pandemic is finished, we can organize it. We can meet again conferences because they will start again, I hope. There could be some uh, student exchange I don't have many Italian students nowadays, but you have a student that uh, you have some funding and you come and he wants to visit my lab, you can arrange it. If there are some joint opportunities for project, I mean, why not? This could be great if you can do it. And then I thank for your passions. Listening to me all this time must be terrible. <laughs> it was great, Dr. Uh, okay, thank uh, you. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I think it is done from our side. I think Professor Bernie's side also. We had a good network all these days. Almost it was 98%, except for here and there, small misses. So network was very nice and we could hear you, see your slides. 
so we didn't have issues on the network or connectivity etc so with this i think we'll take it off uh, for today so i think and thank you for the entire course and uh, stay in touch and i'll mail you back with all the details so manish do, do i mean in in one week or two do we have this meeting with your some faculty members yeah yeah i'm just uh, asking for that i'll just ask what are the formalities uh, from the gyan office again i'll query it i'll just see whether it is uh, absolutely essential if it is yes then we'll go ahead with that or if there is some kind of an mou a sort of a thing that student exchange could be done and if there is so then i'll just get it signed and also put it across to you okay so I look forward to receiving your instructions Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure then. Okay then. Thank you, Professor Bernie. Namaste again. I think namaste. Professor Singh and uh, Vishwanath are also saying a namaste. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Namaskara. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Have a nice time. Bye bye. Bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.